I'm Chuck Norris, and I approve this game. Welcome to the Roll for Initiative podcast. The Roll for Initiative podcast. Volume number three, issue 111. I am DM Vince sitting alongside DM Matt. Hello, everyone. Sitting alongside DM Nick as well. Hi, ho, neighbor. And if this is your first <laughs> time listening to this podcast, we are a podcast about Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 1st Edition. Yes, I'm going to repeat that every single episode. No, I'm kidding. Just every once in a while, to let people know what this is all about in case you're listening for the first time. So, how you guys been doing? Uh, Nick? I've been doing all right, uh, getting ready for the uh, next game for uh, the the kitties uh, for uh, Temple of Elemental Evil. I actually Kitty? came up with, yes, yes for, oh. for the children's, Meow. not those kitties. Oh, okay. That, for the children, for <laughs> Anna and her friends. <laughs> and uh, I actually came up with a really cool um, little, I don't know if you want to call it twist to the plot. Yeah, it's not really a plot twist, but I'm more of a get the kids a little more involved to show how desperate the situation is. Something's going to happen, and it's going to really impact how they're going to go. So I'm really looking forward to writing that one up and see, really getting the kids into their characters. And I've been reading and? that book that Tim Cask recommended to us, oh. Playing at the World. I have like John Peterson shelf. I have 700 pages almost. I'm just like afraid to touch it right now. Oh my gosh. This thing is amazing. Right. I'm up to page 400 right now. And this is written. Is it- I'll tell you right now. If you, if you like history, if you like the whole history premise of, of anything like myself, because yes. I'm a big history geek. I love this book because it is chock full of information. If you want something a little more um, casual reading, this is not the book for you. Ah, this is very detailed, very, and it just doesn't go into the beginning of D&D. It goes into how it started, the whys and the wherefores, you know, where all the influences came from. And there's copious amounts of, of footnotes. Uh, I remember one chapter... It had at the end of the chapter over like a hundred and fifty footnotes just for the one chapter. Huh? So, yes. yeah, if you are familiar with history textbooks, this is how this is formatted. Oh, so it's a real sleeper. It, I think, for some people, it could be. <laughs> but if you want to find out the whys of where all the influences came from, I think you're going to find some interesting tidbits of information out here. I mean, I mean, you're going to find some stuff like you had no idea where the influences came from. I mean, like from, I'm just reading right now, some of the influences of role-playing came from the sci-fi fan fiction magazine stuff that was going on in the 60s. It, okay, he's falling asleep. Oh, I'm sorry. Were you reading something? I don't know. No, I was to explain. Anyway, uh, just give you a kind of a synopsis. Yeah, that's that's kind of what the book is, but um, I, I like, I'm liking it. I'm really enjoying it. So that's what I've been doing so far. Okay. <laughs> I didn't mean to fall asleep. I was kidding. Yeah, fine. Whatever. I'll shut up then. <laughs> All right. I hate you. <laughs> Man. Uh, anyway, uh, so let's go over to our resident star, Matt, uh, who is a movie star. No, I'm kidding. Matt, how's it going? Uh, going okay. Um, had a severe lack of gaming the past week since I missed last week's show due to intestinal issues. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. You failed as con. Yeah, was- I did. Failed my con Saturday night. Um, I th- managed to make it out of bed about 7.30 p.m. on Dang. Sunday. I saw the Facebook. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. So you failed your decks. Failed my con. You failed your, what's next, strength? I, I, I'm I afraid at this point. Wisdom, <laughs> I, yeah. Wisdom, well, that happens every time you have a few drinks. You fail wisdom. Yes. <laughs> and unfortunately, though, it wasn't even... Where uh, instance where I over imbibed either it was just I guess something I ate or something, so it yeah. wasn't even like it was from a 
uh, wacky night out that'll give me stories to tell the grandkids. So, so I, well, you're living Cincy, right? Yes. You went to Skyline, didn't you? No, actually, I don't like Skyline. I don't okay. like the Cincinnati chili. <gasps> no. Shock horror. Yes. I know everyone brags about the chili too. I'm um, like, I why like would it. you want runny crap? <laughs> Not conforming to the mass media opinion of everything. First it's the Walking Dead, now it's the chili. Exactly. I I have my own preferences, and quite frankly, I have no use for Cincinnati chili. Rebel like without a it. cause. He's like the new James Dean. Yeah. I like it. Hey. Yeah. Hey. Was that but I like it. Yes. <laughs> but then again, I'll eat anything. So. Yeah. Yes, whereas I'm horribly neurotic about food and very, very picky. Five-year-olds yeah, aren't as picky. years of military service, you can't be picky. Yeah. yeah. You get Is it dead? Off. Okay. Grill it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you get that, like, white slop on the bread and everything? And That's gravy. It's all right. Oh, is that what it's called? <laughs> yeah, just add some salt and pepper. You're good. Ugh. <laughs> and you have 10 minutes to eat, right? If you're lucky. Yeah, I know my brother-in-law when he came back from uh, – his service over in Iraq, as soon as we, he'd sit down and do everything, he'd look at his plate and um, 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 and he wouldn't say a word. And then all of a sudden he'd be done. It was like, dude. <laughs> yeah. It took me a while to kind of break you that habit. Yourself? So, yeah. So, how about you, uh, Vince? What well, you been up to? I did have a game this weekend I had to cancel because I was sick too. I failed my constitution check. Oh. And, Failed uh, save versus poison. Yeah, I wasn't feeling well, so I had to cancel my game, and the group was a little bit bad. But, you know, things happen. What are you going to do? Yeah. Sorry, guys. I know some of them listen, so sorry, guys. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. Yeah, you know, it happens. It does, and I apologize. And, you know, next week we'll play or the week after, whatever. Anyway, uh, if you probably heard a laugh or two in the background of a different voice, and uh, we're going to introduce that different Who is it? Voice. Right after this. No, there's no commercials on the show. Sorry. <laughs> After this commercial break. After this, we'll be back after these words. Matt, insert a word here. Word. There we go. We're back, folks. Oh, it could have been like spatula. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, so our guest this week is filling in as our guest DM, GM. Well, we'll just call him GM for this week. And it's Jason. Not that Jason. (laughs) Jason Voorhees. Oh, no, he's going to kill Not that Jason either. This is Jason without a Y. We'll call him Jason without a Y. Jason, how are you? I'm doing pretty well, going on about uh, two hours sleep, so uh, hopefully I can, uh, yeah, work on my, uh, I don't know. It's like he's falling asleep now. <laughs> just it was from Nick reading from there. that book. I didn't yeah. read from the book. That was actually from my, no- hey. <laughs> <laughs> History novel in effect. Anyway. Yeah, so Jason, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you've been up to? All right. Well, um, I guess I'd go with my. Uh, I'll start off with my like gaming pedigree, so to speak. That's what everyone seems to do. So I started uh, with uh, Blue Book, probably in 1981, and um, yeah, and I got and I got started. Uh, I was it was uh, I was going to day camp and. Uh, they had, you know, swimming in the morning and then for whatever reason, they didn't have anything, uh, specific going on in the afternoon. And they, so they had another swim kind of a thing. And, um, a couple of the counselors were like, well, look, if you don't want to go swimming, you can do this. We're going to play this game. And it mm-hmm. happened to be Dungeons and Dragons. And I was like, I played a cleric and, uh, I was just like immediately hooked. I was like, this is awesome. Like I got to turn, I remember turning like skeletons or zombies. And then, um, for whatever reason, they gave me a, uh, a ring of fireballs and I don't know why they would give a cleric that, but anyway, so I, I used the, the ring and it turned out to be cursed and it came back and it, and it fried me and oh, man. That's, <laughs> gave it to you. But here's, here's the thing is like, I was like, I died like in a half an hour and it didn't matter. I still love the game. So from that so point I on, just picture they're going like, here's this ring of fireballs. Yeah, <laughs> I, I thought it was awesome. Like, and yeah, little, little did I know. Um, wow. So then I kind of was on a, a mission from that point on to find people to play Dungeons and Dragons with. Um, 
and then for uh for that christmas i got i got you know the 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 blue book the box set and i'm not really sure why but i didn't invite like <laughs> my friends in the neighborhood instead i invited the neighbors who are like in their 40s and stuff and so i ran a really short campaign that was it was really short lived probably like two or three sessions but i like you know retrospectively it would it's probably looking pretty funny because I'm like 11 year old, you know, and I'm like playing with all these adults and I'm like the DM and it was, it was kind of cool. But, um, so then, uh, in seventh grade, I kind of finally found my group and, uh, we played, um, basic, the, uh, Mulvey cook edition. Mm -hmm. And then, um, Sorry. later on, uh, we got into AD and D like later that, uh, I think uh, my friend Mel, he was the DM. He got he got the the DM guide and uh, player's handbook and monster manual for Christmas, and pretty much played that game all throughout high school. Um, I mean, we also played Champions for a while. We played Rifts for a while, but it was you know it was always like those marathon sessions, you know, of like Friday night and Saturday night playing to like six a.m which is uh, pretty awesome. And those you know, were the days, huh? They were, you know, and it's like you'd play all night and then you, you know, we played in the basement, which is, you know, I guess probably stereotypical. And then when you like leave, you know, it's like the sun's coming up and it's like, you felt like you accomplished something like, yes, I beat yeah, the night. You feel like you're finally emerging out of the dungeon. Literally. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of, um, kind of my background the other thing is when i started playing i also started collecting comics and i really and at the time there was this i don't know if you guys are familiar but there was this uh series called marvel universe you guys know yeah. about that yeah yeah oh heck yeah yeah okay so when i'm reading this it was like really i gotta be honest it was like the one comic that i was really reading a lot i started to um this is before i knew about champions i started like breaking down like the skills and the powers. And I started kind of working on my own superhero game. Cause at the, at, at that point I didn't, I didn't know about champions and didn't, I don't think Marvel superheroes was out yet. Yeah. I think Marvel superheroes came out like 83, yeah. 84, somewhere yeah, in there. It was 83, 84 for Marvel. That sounds about right. Yeah. So I was kind of working on my own superhero uh, game. I mean, that wasn't, I wasn't really working on game mechanics cause I couldn't, I didn't really grasp that uh, aspect of it. But I was, you know, working on skills and abilities and also kind of I was tailoring it kind of like I really uh, for some reason I liked the idea of kind of low powered superheroes like in this game in theory, like you couldn't be like the Hulk, you know, you couldn't be like Superman, you couldn't be anything like that. You could be more like martial artists, you know, like Master of Kung Fu or Moon Knight or Batman um, and that kind of like stuck with me in, in terms of like. It's like humble, I guess, is the word. I kind of like mm -hmm. that idea. Um, so that's kind of like followed me throughout because I've been working on uh, like game design and whatnot. I just kind of started back up again about a year and a half ago. And um, yeah, I guess I could I could keep talking <laughs> about this okay. if you want. Um, I guess I, I, I was working on um, this web series and in one of the episodes – uh, these characters are playing Dungeons and Dragons. Okay. And so um, I didn't have any of my materials, so I went ahead and on eBay and bought um, the uh, Metzer edition of Basic and Expert. Cool. A and so, you know, I, I had it for this episode, but then I started reading it again, and I was like, well, I, I kind of want to play again. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I, I'm missing this. Um, and the other thing that happened was, I think it was coincidental. I'm not sure. I also, because, you know, no offense to those books, but they're kind of scattered in, in terms of, you know, how they're laid out. And, and I was thinking about like, I should combine expert and basic into one. This mm -hmm. is before I knew about the whole retro clone thing. Mm -hmm. Um, so then, you know, I started getting more into it and then I, I actually downloaded uh labyrinth Lord and it was kind of a, a curse and a blessing because I was like, oh, this is what I would do. So I kind of stopped that idea. But it was, you know, um, but I've since gone on to like uh, working on other things. But I guess that's enough. That's all you need to know. 
<laughs> During your interview, if you heard a loud thud, I don't know if anybody heard that or not. I hope not. But that was my bookshelf saying, rejecting the Advanced Dungeons and Dragons second edition player's handbook from it four times in a row. And then <laughs> across the room. Now that's funny. <laughs> it, yeah, it fell off the shelf four. I, I'm going to say fell with a quotation. You can't see me quoting it, but it fell off the shelf four times when I put it back up there since I found it today. So I have a feeling the book is cursed. I'm no longer putting it on my shelf, and anybody that wants this cursed book may have it. <laughs> I think your unseen servant just said no. Yeah. <laughs> like, no, you're not allowed to have a second edition book in your library. <laughs> Who are you crazy? Yeah, but is your. Yeah. Uh, is your house haunted? Is that possible? Uh, I don't think so. I just think it doesn't like... Well, if it's haunted, then it really has a, a bias to get second edition. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it it surely like, does. I don't like second edition. Get this off my shelf and threw it across the room. You know? Just weird. Anyway. Well, thank you, Jason. We appreciate your uh, your background. It was interesting. I like that. I'm glad you like Labyrinthor because I love that too myself. I yeah, Labyrinthor. Pretty cool game. Pretty cool. I have that in Mutant Future. Uh, I printed up my own like Traveler edition of it and Spiral Bind it. Yeah, it was nice. A tiny little edition, so I love using. I have to pick up Mutant Future. I haven't gotten that yet. You should. It's really it's it's really interesting. I hear if if you like it, then you really like a Mutant Future. From my guess, from what I gather. I think Mutant Future just killed Nick because he's went away for a second. Yeah. So. Huh? Did, what? No, did, I'm here. Oh, okay. Sorry. Did <laughs> Did you mention Gamma World? I I haven't seen that 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 version either but is it is it like a clone of gamma world not really it's kind of like gamma world but it's like their own version of gamma world different rules matt right different rules kind of uh, i actually haven't seen it or heard of it prior oh. to this so i'm just taking it all in like huh i'll have to hunt this down wow we actually got stumped we stumped matt the producer yeah stumped. Matt, we 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 won the we won Nick we won. Yeah, yeah I, we each get hundred experience points. Looks like I failed my intelligence check today. Now, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, what stats you got left? That's uh, half the stats, man. Okay. What are you gonna do next? Let's see. So uh, we've got wisdom, strength, and charisma. <laughs> uh oh, failed that years ago. <laughs> yeah. Well, next time you go on a trip, Matt, if you don't. You know, score. We're gonna say you lost your charisma roll there. <laughs> right. Wisdom. Well, that depends on how much you drink and how pretty she is at the end of the night. <laughs> Knowing me, it'd be more like I'm in some horribly disfiguring accident. More like, and I'll need a Phantom of the Opera mask. No, that well, that would like John no. the, the mask would give you some cooled points, so that would yeah, not. Yeah, I'll, I'll be true. mysterious. No, oh, God. <laughs> serious types. Ew. Producer fired. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone wants a job hey, with producer? So I, I want to produce a show. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway. So let's head on just a little bit of, uh, oh, yes, stars. Nick, stars. Yes, we have stars. And just to remind everybody out there that for Roll for Initiative podcast, you can find us on iTunes. Just go to the iTunes store, type in Roll for Initiative in the search area and you can hunt us down from there and click on reading for reviews and you can add a review to our show. We appreciate every review that we get. We got two reviews, one from, um, it says sci-fi traveler. Okay. He says, I, I found a new weekly must listen here. And he gives us five stars. stars. So he says, I, he, yeah, five stars, 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 stars. St oh, sorry. I was in my Resident Evil mode. Okay, okay. Let's you never play Resident Evil, huh? Mm -hmm. Okay, he, uh, but Sci-Fi Traveler says, I've started playing D&D and AD&D in the late 70s and early 80s, respectively. Yeah. Those systems opened the door to adventure for me, and I still find myself gaming today. So if you're looking for a quality podcast con covering AD&D and Universal RPG con concepts this podcast is one for you i find the discussions well thought out and enjoy the host as they point out counterpoints bleh i'm sorry they enjoy the host as they point and counterpoint different topics boy i failed over save there too i highly recommend everyone interested in ad and d or rpgs in general give it a listen cheers to the host keep up the great content yeah. And he signs it Weston Lightfingers. So that must be his <laughs> PC name of a thief. That's kind of a cool name, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to use that. Well, um, thank you. Our next one is from E Man the Wumpus. <laughs> and he gives us five stars. It says, awesome and much appreciated. 
this is a great podcast, particularly if you're particularly like me and remember when D and D books were all printed in black and white. Yes, Yay. we do. I think the four hosts together have great chemistry and balance of personalities and gaming knowledge. My only question is, dun, heck, dun. what have you done with Blackstone? <laughs> hey, good question. Uh, oh, yeah, that's right. And in fact, uh, Jason, you have to pass that file along to Matt that you had created for us, actually, where you took all the Blackstones and put them together. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you can you can download that on um on my SoundCloud uh, account. Okay. Uh, give that link to Matt to stick into uh, our show notes later on after the show. Sure. Yeah. Everybody, if anyone's interested, you can download all the Blackstone segments and. Yes, one there's big, an anthology of Blackstone's vault. One big chunk since Blackstone has been missing. Well, Actually, there's... I, I have to say though that I think he's going to make a return very soon. Yeah. Nice. Finally, all the threats he's coming back out. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> he was on hiatus. Was that the end of the uh, review? Yeah, that's all the reviews that we have for this week. So thank you, everyone. Yes, and uh, we'll make sure to bring Blackstone back. Yes, absolutely. I think probably in the next few weeks, you might hear something from the guy. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> then again, you might not if you're going to be that snotty about it. <laughs> <laughs> we love Blackstone. <laughs> Right, yeah. So uh, a little bit of geeky news. I wanted to throw that in there because I recently had seen on ComingSoon.net. Geeky news on a, a, a podcast about Advanced Dungeons and Dragons? Who would have thought? <laughs> yeah, okay. True. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to beat the dead horse here for you. Guess what was just signed, Nick? Guess what was just signed? Guess, guess, guess. You'll never guess. Wait a minute. Hold on. I know this one. Okay, I'm going to give you a couple hints here. No, 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 don't tell me. Okay. I think I know where you're going with this. Go ahead. Uh, about a particular movie with a particular uh, star signing on? Maybe. Hmm. Oh, well, then proceed. Why don't you get, why, what, do, what do you think the answer is? I am I pretty much heard that uh, Harrison Ford has signed on to do the new Star Wars movie. That is one of the answers, yes. There's actually two answers here. I have two. And Carrie Fisher? Well, no, I was talking about Harrison Ford. Yes, he signed on to the Star Wars, but we knew that was going to happen. But yeah, I bet you there's a clause in that, though. Like he has to preview the script. Probably. Yeah. We all knew that was going to happen yeah. anyway. So, but uh, I'm glad he's on. So me too. But something else that's it's maybe more of a B horror cult classic type thing going on, and mm. Matt may know a little bit more about it. Yes, because there will be a remake of a certain movie, Evil Dead. But, but ah, along the same lines, what has Bruce Campbell, Sam Raimi, and Ivan Raimi always said never to do? Beat the dead horse. And what would that include, Matt? Come on. Matt. Mm, damn intelligence check. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say it. They've signed for Evil Dead 4. No. Yes, they have. 2014 Evil Dead 4 starring Bruce Campbell. No way. Yep. They've done it. They've beat the dead horse, and that movie will be coming out. They're working on a script right now. Bruce Campbell and his chin will be back. <laughs> yep. I, I have no idea. They have no direction or any hints to give out, but... Uh, I think there'll be a lot of evil dead in it. It's supposed to follow along <laughs> the same... A lot of evil dead in it. Wow. It's supposed to follow along the same cheesy goodness that came with Ar that came out with Army of Darkness, so... Yay! Yeah. I love Army of Darkness. So that's geeky news. <laughs> if you have I like it. News, give us a uh, ring or a ding or whatever else. Or don't. Ring a ding dong? Ring a ding ding dong. Let's head into some sage advice. Okay. Sage advice. Sage advice. Sage advice. Sage advice. We're going to have some sage advice. Jason, you want to sing? Sage advice. Oh. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Lounge act number three. Cool. We can like headline in Vegas, oh. do our own version of the uh, rat pack. No, I think they would kill us. Call us the geek well, pack. Well, they're already all dead, so. No, no, I, th I meant the fans. Oh, oh, the fans. The rat pack. <laughs> yes, the rat pack will come and kill us. Rat, rat pack as zombies. Oh, Ooh, yeah. No, it said I do. So. 
Anything to do with zombies, Matt hates. Now, so. but if they were lounge singing, though, I am for some lounge singing. and I am a fan of Richard Cheese. <laughs> well, good. Go watch uh, Angel, the TV show. They have dead zombies on singing in the lounge on that, so. Good times. Definitely. Meanwhile. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, bad man. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Okay, so we have our first email. If you want our email us, that's rfistaff at gmail.com, or you can dial us in at 570-865-4210. Where now Jason is standing by. <laughs> first email comes from Mike, a.k.a. Celestian from the forums. Hey. Hey, Mike. I have a question regarding role-playing, in quotes, like Dr. Evil, role-playing, how do you handle situations where a player is running a high charismatic, sorry, high charisma character and he's trying to influence someone using it? Anyone want to answer that question? Ah, don't. Now, before you answer that, <laughs> think. Okay, cool. <laughs> now, before you answer that, think about, say, a person playing an elf with a high dexterity that is wanting to perform some elaborate maneuver. When a player tries to use his charisma to influence somebody, someone, I tend to ask them to role play it. Quote, quote. Mm -hmm. On the flip side, I certainly do not expect them to role play some move that requires high dexterity. I've asked players to do that before just to see if they do it, and it has happened. I need to point it and laugh, didn't you? Yes, I did. Okay, is, cool. this, <laughs> is this fair? Me, personally, when I DM, have in the past tried to get people to role play the charisma actions, though thinking about it, mm hmm. I'm not sure if that's fair. I know for a fact I am not highly charismatic, so asking me to role play it, I am a terrible, terrible RPG. No, I told. Hmm. Take two. I am a terrible role player, but I love to play. Is like asking me to tightrope walk while spinning six plates. It's going to be a mess. I think that'd be, be best not to penalize players for being unable to role play out charisma situations, but. If they do not get, but if they do give them a bonus, to, right? But if they do give them a bonus to roll and check, should I even feel the need to make one if they do? P.S. Vincent, during our Denton game, yeah, Mike is in my local group. If that room with the ice floor trap and hourglass was made up on the spot, as I suspect it might have been, you are really great on your feet. Thanks, Mike. Yes, that was made up on the spot, Mike. You already knew that. Good job. Anyone want to tackle this, Nick? Because he's that good, and he's evil. <laughs> no, not oh. that part. <laughs> the role play part. Right. Um, I guess. I guess you really have to know your players. At least in my opinion, you got to know where their comfort zone is. You know, there might be some players who they, they they're okay with that. They they're okay with role playing out. Uh, you know, a particular. You know. Uh, thing they might have to do with charisma, trying to influence a non-player character or something like that. Others, they might just want to explain what they're trying to do and just, you know, go with the, you know, the uh, reaction adjustment role, what have you. So I think it comes down to that. I think it comes down to that player's particular, you know, comfort level. Are they okay with role playing a little bit or not? Hmm. What do you think, Jason? Yeah, I think that's it's almost a version of uh, metagaming because it's you you know the player is not the character, so you you really can't penalize you know the the player for doing something that they don't have or do have. So, um, but yeah, like it, it makes for interesting role play if they're trying that. But you can't. I don't think it's it's fair to penalize them for something that they you know can or cannot do and go with you know the, i mean that's why you know you have bonuses you know for reaction adjustments yeah so um but yeah like nick said if you know go with the player and if they're comfortable but again don't like let it influence maybe the game mechanic if that makes sense yeah it does. Mm -hmm. that makes sense absolutely yeah. yeah so i guess that's what i would say uh, yeah i agree with you what you're all saying matt do you want have any two cents to add yeah i'm Similar, I typically let my players start with the role play, and then depending on what they're trying to accomplish, I may decide this would be easy enough, we can just role play through it. Or if it's something real challenging, you're, they're going to need to roll. Like, I had a situation recently in my uh, home group where we were, they were trying to uh, barter with a merchant. This 
at that point, it's a roll. I mean, you can only go back and forth between, well, I think your boots are only worth two gold. Well, the merchant's like, no, I think it's worth three. No, just let's just roll and get this over with. To speed things and if along. If they fail, what do you, you just say? What do you think you're doing? Is some sort of Jedi or something? Oh, actually, what happened is the uh, I had it, had them do a, an opposed charisma roll, and let's just say my player rolled a one. At that oh. point, the merchant was so insulted because by he kicked him out and wouldn't sell anything to him. That's awesome. Wow. It's yeah. like you get out of my store. You insult my goods. This is quality craftsmanship. Get out. You live now. Yes, he was. Yeah. So basically, there is one. Also for you, two weeks. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what happened. My player's like, "What happened?" But oh no! And then they had to go find another store to get the boots they needed. All I did was pick my nose and wipe my butt on his counter. I don't understand. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I just did Taylor Swifting across the room. Oh god. Oh. <laughs> If you watch South Park if you want to figure out that reference. Anyway. <laughs> so there you go, Mike. Our next email comes from Rob, and he says, Hi, I'm new to Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 1st Edition, so new to this podcast. I wanted to start around the beginning. I found the show on the Beholder and clicked to listen to your brow- and browser button, but it gave me a message saying to follow me through a new link. I did so, but I didn't find the old shows. Are your older shows available? Thanks much. Uh, I believe when we started posting these shows up, we didn't actually put a show link in there, Matt, right? Right. I think most of them should. Cause, or up, I up to the point before you took over was all Jason. He didn't actually put the link in the show. Right. Notes. Yeah, and I know I went back and try to get as many as possible but there might be some that are missing at a certain date so i'll have to the lost episodes yeah no well, that's not the lost episode <laughs> no there, there, there is a yeah there is a lost episode we have of our show but we cannot play that show no no unfortunately it is sealed in a vault and not to be opened otherwise it'll be similar to opening the ark of the covenant that is correct my face will melt it's, yes it will. yes and any, all who listen to it melt. Yes, melt and die. That's not good. Your dungeon suck himself would probably cry too. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the next email, thanks, Rob. And uh, if you need any help uh, finding older shows, there is two spots you can click on the website for our library for MP3s or our library for the Enhanced, and both of them will show what our old episodes are and Matt put up the link for the new yeah. feed. Right. If you can. Will do. This next email comes from another player in my group actually. His name is we call him Geo Jeff because his name is spelled with a G instead of a Jeff. Oh like Jeff Peterson on the Late Late Show. Yeah. The undead robot. <laughs> yes. He said hey guys because he goes by Crit Taco on our forums. <laughs> taco yeah i love that name is that when you go to taco bell and you get the wrong taco <laughs> <laughs> yeah something like that i recently listened to episode 108 fantastic job as a player i like to have a custom made character i get i like to have a custom made character i get tired of the mundane weapons and armor how do you as gms i don't see any gms here do you handle players who wish to Create custom made weapons and inventions, Jeff. Mm. Uh, Matt, we'll start with you. Well, I've never really had that happen. A uh, tip what I would probably do though is I would just make it a giant role play session. Um, and for what, so they would have to like, okay, how are you designing this contraption you're trying to create? And what do you want it to accomplish? Have them actually spell that out. And then just for the uh, stats, like if it's a weapon, be like, okay, how do you want – okay, th- think what weapons would be similar in damage and try it that way. So, I mean, really it would be more of a fluff description in my game than actually something new mechanically. Hmm. Mm. Yeah. I know for weapons, uh, I would tell them to kind of write it out and then seek out a blacksmith in the game to help them design it. Mm-hmm. Inventions, find a gnome. Go to the gnome city, find a tinker. There you go. Watch them screw it up for you. Yeah. 
Yeah, I guess like for weapons, I don't know. I've never run into that situation. Yeah, before. I haven't but either. I guess, I guess what I would do is I would do something similar to Jace would say is like probably have the character do some research probably with a blacksmith on maybe working closely with the blacksmith on like, hey, this is the design I want. This is what I wanted to do. Can you do this? What do I have to take into consideration? I guess that would be one way. I it's it would almost be like kind of like a role play situation, but I don't know as far as stats and stuff. Oh, that's a that's a toughie. I mean, <laughs> as soon as I you know heard the question, I'm like, oh great, they want to design the three bladed sword from the sword and the sorcerer, <laughs> or uh, the glaive from from crawl. So you know. Which is not a glaive at all. It doesn't look like anything like a pole arm. Yeah. But, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I guess I'd do the same thing like you would do, Vince. Yeah. You know, just just uh, work closely with the blacksmith, and as far as after that, you know, the the stats for it that would come out later. I don't know what I would use for a reference. So I guess it depends on what it's. Is it like a sword? Is it like a pole arm? Is it like a dagger? What do you? I mean. I guess I would use something as a baseline. What if it was a duck? Well, then, um, see, the duck? <laughs> it depends on what species. Is yeah. it more like a mallard? Is it like a... Is it a horse-sized duck? Yes. <laughs> and what is the size of the duck? Speaking of ducks, actually, uh, speaking in size of, we actually have one of my players in my group said when he wanted to start this new campaign I started a couple weeks ago. His name is David. He want, He's like, uh, I'll play in a game, but I want a war chicken. So I actually had to sit down one day and design a war chicken for him. <laughs> so war I actually, chicken? Yeah, I wrote up chicken, comma, war. <laughs> I statted, War chicken. I, yeah, I statted the whole chicken out for him. And the chicken is, is more awesome than he is, actually, at this point. Well, you know, when the chicken dies, at least he won't be without a meal. Oh, he's going to be insulted by that, Nick. I don't care. It's a war chicken, dude. And should. <laughs> If two he, foot high, two foot high war chicken. Okay, you know I've heard of war moose. You know I'm good with a war moose. The lair you know, moose. Uh, uh, a war, a war. You know a killer whale that you could write in, but a chicken. It's awesome, the war chicken. Yeah, it is really. It, it is. If he's using it as a mount, if it gets attacked, decapitated, he'll still be able to travel a little bit. No, it's not a mount. It's just he, he has. He's playing a magic user. Oh, okay. His magic. Obviously, user. the magic user is insane. The magic user's name is Old Humey. They just call him Old Humey, even though he's not really old. <laughs> I have no idea. That's the other, I'm not old. <laughs> and he has an attraction to half orcs. <laughs> okay. Because wow. his character wow. spent time in jail with a half orc. We'll just leave it at that. Uh. So he's attracted to half orcs, and he has a war chicken. Yes, Old Humey. Not a war rooster. <laughs> do, the, a war do the half orcs think his war chicken sexy? No, the war chicken came after his affliction for uh, half orcs. Okay, it's a long story that I can't really repeat on a family podcast. So fade to black. Think mm. yourself. Got it. Got it. Got it. Uh, okay, so thank you. Uh, <laughs> I've heard it all now. A war chicken. What's our next email before we uh, digress? Even I want to have a war goldfish. You too can have a war goldfish. How much damage can a war chicken do? A two foot high war chicken, uh, yeah. D four damage for a beak and D four damage for a claw. As much as a dagger. That's not bad. I mean, yeah, if it's a magic user, they're going to do the same thing. And uh, you wear leather armor on the chicken, so yeah. <laughs> uh, we are getting in a really, really <laughs> dark area right now. Uh, I'm going to dress my war chicken in leather. <laughs> You got like a real nonconformist uh, player there. It sounds like. Oh yeah, I, I encourage things in my group to be non-traditional. I don't really. Re- yes. I, well, I, no I, matter how warped it, as they <laughs> are, he encourages it. <laughs> Why? Hey, it works. It sounds like it works. You know. It does and it's a lot of fun. My games aren't like traditional. I'm going to stick to the book and be this dungeon master that hides behind my screen and you know, those things like that. So. I do have the war chicken works. That's that's just a whole wow. <laughs> that's I think Nick, Nick has a secret fantasy about war chickens. No, it's just like what? okay. At least that's it wasn't cool. a duck, all right. 
So, so does it lay war eggs? Or are they like grenades? Which, you know? <laughs> we haven't decided. <laughs> he actually did ask that question, well, does it lay eggs? And I said, yes, it lays eggs, but only for purposes of eating, and that's it. He can't, like, <laughs> hurl them, like, and they explode. <laughs> no, I don't want to give him any more ideas. <laughs> what? What if, oh, wait, we'll edit that out. What if he took the eggs and just let them sit around for a while and threw them as a grenade a stink cloud? That you could do, and it'd be very disgusting, Matt. Thank you for giving him another idea. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Next email before I get any more ideas for him. This one comes from DM Kojo. Yay. Oh, hey, DM Kojo. Cool. He greets us in his normal greeting of RFI gurus. I don't know. We're gurus now. Yay. Wow. If you've seen his post on our forums, you've noticed he's recently acquired a copy of the Deities and Demiguys book with the Cthulhu mythos in it for a reasonable price. Did he fail his sand? Did he what? Did he fail his sanity? Yeah, he must have, yes, because he paid for the book. So <laughs> he got a pretty good deal on it, actually. So he sat down and read the book, and he was shocked to find something that he totally missed a couple years ago when he was a kid. <coughs> he found that on page 9, under the heading of Clerics and Deities, that it states first and second level spells are gained through Clerics' faith alone. Mm-hmm. This rule he never knew and never used, pretty much. Uh, he said, it went on, however, it said, a third and fourth level spells are granted by the means of the clerk's deity or the deity themselves if it is a demigod. Therefore, a demigod cannot grant spells above fifth level. So the cleric of a demigod may not use sixth or seventh level spells. In addition, the on- in addition, only greater gods can grant seventh level spells, meaning if the cleric worships a lesser god, they only get to use up to six level spells. This explains why the book is divided deities into demigods, lesser, greater gods in the book. This is an interesting rule, and I just never used it because I never really knew about it. I suspect that when I read this book in when I read this book in the eighties, my power gaming tendencies were distracted by the tables of ability scores over eighteen on page seven, and I never really read the next few pages. <laughs> Perfectly understandable. Yeah. <laughs> so my question to you, Nick, and I'm pointing at you if I were standing next to you. I'm scared. Okay, uh, I won't point at you then. I'm not scared. Okay. Then I will point at you with a dagger. Is whether or not you force this rule when your players are using a cleric, or do you hand wave and let it whatever spell the and it allows them to do? Thanks to keep up the great work, Game Coach. Nick, good I, question. Is, wow, <laughs> is that Christopher Walken? Yeah, questions, clerics, spells, going crazy there. Wow, actually, um. I guess I would if I'm using deities and demigods. I think I would impose those particular restrictions. I I think it makes sense because yeah. there's certain power levels of gods, and only certain gods can grant so many power. It was like the thing when I brought up about um, uh, module uh, N1 uh, against the cult of the reptile god. Blech. That the whole thing with the temple in the in the town, all the priests were turned over to the reptile cult. How are these? You know, uh, high level, higher level clerics like fifth level and such getting third level spells. What um, I don't have the book in front of me. What year was Deity and Demigod printed at? Nineteen eighty. Eighty. So it became it was before the DMG. Uh, uh, no, DMG after. was seventy nine. That's right, seventy nine. Yeah. Yeah. So it was after. Hmm. Because it contradicts kind of what the DMG says in a way. So what do you do? Go for the DMG, I say. I get, you know what? I think it's entirely up to the DM in that mm-hmm. respect. I mean, yeah. if you want to go with the DM uh, Dungeon Master Guide, the the guidelines were provided there, go for it. But if you like deities and demigods about, you know, the power uh, progression of the different gods and what they can grant, go with that too. Whatever works in your game, but like we always say, be consistent. Mm-hmm. Word. Word. Word up. Jason, what do you I, think? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Nick. Were you not done? No, I th- I was just going to say I think I would use that though. I would, I would use deities and demigods. Okay, Jason. Uh, uh, D- uh. DMG. I guess I'd go with that. Um. Oh. Hmm. Hmm. Uh. I, I guess it depends no, on. There's no right or wrong answer here. Yeah, there really isn't. I guess it depends on maybe the god they're they they're worshiping. And just like the how that's gonna limit 
maybe uh their spell use i don't know i guess like uh, i don't know i don't really have uh I have a solid stance on this. I've never really used it, so. Yeah. 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 I have used the first and second level spells only not coming from the god themselves, but faith. Yeah, it's right. What yeah. it says. Yeah. yeah. I use that uh, so that way it kind of keeps those clerics in line because if mm. all of a sudden they're still faithful, they, but they're not really following the tenets as well as they should – Oh no! Why can't you get a third level spell? Perhaps you should be a better cleric. <laughs> yeah, Matt's a mean DM. <laughs> it's not evil. He's just mean. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but you I'm know, also I, I... also the one who, if they want to try something that maybe they don't quite have access to, and they're a cleric, I let them appeal to their god. And depending on how faithful they've been, the god will grant them some things that they wouldn't be able to do normally. Uh, in my game, the cleric needed had no torches, no light, and he was trying to flee a tower that w- was flooding. So he like prayed to the giant spaghetti monster because that's the deity he worships, and uh, ha, 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 ha. yeah, spaghettios. Yes. He he appealed to it, and the spaghetti monster heard his call and was like, "Here, here's a little light pebble, go." <laughs> So, if they're because he was a good cleric in that instance, because one of the tenets of the spl- flying spaghetti monster is pirates are very good people. They prevent global warming because the more pi- pirates and global warming have an inverse relationship. More pirates, less global warming. More global warming, less pirates. And they, were, his group was actually doing battle with pirates at the time, and he chose not to get involved and left. So he was being good. In the eyes of the spaghetti monster, so that's why the spaghetti monster granted him the light to flee. I don't understand the spaghetti monster's philosophy of global warring versus the pirates, but all right, yeah. When, yeah, just go with it. Don't don't question the spaghetti monster. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I will not. I I think it also brings up the larger question with you know with clerics and their and their faith is okay. how much does a does religion play in your fantasy campaign how much of an influence do the gods and goddesses and and other divine beings do they have a role in the lives of the player characters in the in your game world so i i guess you know do you really want something that restrictive or not for me i kind of like it i think it adds a particular layer of Mm -hmm. of of reality to it so I'm just wondering if the spaghetti monster is Prego based or ragu based. Oh, you know, I think you got to go with Prego. I think so too. I think you know. I think he's far more accepting and embraces all kinds, oh, okay. including even the Newman's way. <gasps> <coughs> it's organic. Yeah, the spaghetti monster must die. And actually, I've had Newman's own pasta sauce. It's pretty good. Nick, you must know. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's for I charity. Hate you. <laughs> okay. It's for charity. Yeah, I know. It's yeah, for- it d- doesn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. Give all their uh, uh, all their profits to uh, charity. Oh. Yeah. Anyway, I think we have one more email left. This one comes from James Q. Hey guys, long-time listener, first-time correspondent. I recently found a PDF of an early incarnation of M.A.R. Barker's Empire of the Petal Throne game. While I've never been particularly interested in Barker's associated novels, I have been wanting to use the... I've never pronounced this right. Temical? Temuco, how does that pronounce, Nick? T-E-K-U-M-E-L. Tecumel, I think it's pronounced. Tecumel is a campaign setting for AD&D for a while now. Although Empire of the Petal Thrones rules bear a strong family resemblance to those of AD&D and OD&D, some things, like weird magic systems, make conversion seem a more of a daunting task than I've initially envisioned. Do you know if anyone has produced a uh, conversion between the two, between Empire of the Petal Throne and 1E? If not, what monsters, magic, and other AD&D elements can easily be reskinned to fit the setting? It's a shame that after the demise of the Empire of Petal Throne, as a separate game, its only legacy in AD&D was a stupid cum stat. <laughs> James Q. 
I don't think communist is stupid now at this point in my life, so. No, I'm I'm good with the communist stat. I've but... never played Empire of the Middle Throne. I've never even read it, so I can't even answer this question. Sorry. Dude. I'm vaguely familiar with it. I I know the history behind it being it was technically the first campaign setting that was out for D and D. Was it uh, as far as in print for? I guess when if you're not talking about the Greyhawk and Blackmore supplements for original D and D. Um, yeah, Empire of the Petal Throne. I know when it was produced, the original box set. And I think it was the first real, one of the first real box sets. Uh-huh. I know they had a beautiful map for it. It was I, I superbly done. And I know this time they asked a question when I was on Save or Die about Empire of the Petal Throne. Mike was always like, "Nah, I don't like it." <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm. It's it's really out there. It's not your typical. It's like warp um, here. It, it's more along the lines of like John Carter, Warlord of Mars kind of thing. It's oh. more along that type of thing. Uh, I, I also get the impression, if you remember later on in the 80s, there was a game called Drone. Yeah. I think it was called. It's kind of like that. Is it like Empire of the Pedal? Oh, Empire of the Pedal. Yeah, it's like Empire, Empire of the Pedal. Yeah. Yes, it is. Pel- is yeah. like Empire of the Pedal. Yeah. Is it like Lamentations of the Flame Princess type thing? Like that warp type of fantasy type of thing. Um, I wouldn't say that. I know when Barker made the the campaign setting, it was more along the lines as if you want to picture the different types of cultures that are more about like India, Mesoamerica, South Central America kind of flavor to the world. I, 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 if I remember correctly, I believe metal is very rare oh. in, in the campaign setting. Uh-huh. Uh, I, I also recall in uh, earlier issues of Dragon Magazine, uh, there was a, also a push for uh, for Empire of the Petal Throne as more of like a also a very good war game setting because of the unique types of. Of, of of armies that are involved with the set, setting, yeah, it's a very much flavor of like, uh, you know, uh, the Barsoom series of books, John Carter, Warlord on Mars kind of thing, mm-hmm. very outlandish swords and sorcery kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. It's almost, yeah, I guess it, it's almost like a precursor to the Dark Sun, mm-hmm. you know, oh, okay. in a way. It's kind of, uh, it, that sort of flavor, kind of dark sunish, kind of dying earth kind of thing. Um, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of Gonzo in a way too. Oh, I <laughs> yeah, I actually <laughs> found an AD and D conversion rules. <gasps> you did? Yes, um, at, on Temecula dot com. It's the uh, uh, website just devoted to. The world of the Petal Throne, they have unofficial rules, and they have a list of conversions for a ton of game systems. So uh, T-E-K-U-M-E-L dot com? Yeah. Okay. Put those in the game notes. Yes, totally. Because they have rules for RuneQuest, AD&D, 3rd Edition, Fudge, Cinematic oh, Role-Playing, t- Talislantia. <laughs> I mean, wow. they've got really? Talislantia? Yeah. Oh, wow, cool. Yeah. Hey. I love Fudge. Matt made his intelligence uh, yeah. check this time. Awesome. Yeah. No, he just made his Google food check. That's yeah. All. Well, I had a lot of bonuses thanks to the go- never, aid of the Google. Never, ever Matt's Google food. Ever. Yeah. Only his intelligence for today. Yeah. So that's cool. all the emails we have. Uh, Jason, do you have any uh, input about Empire of the Piddle Throne? I-, I don't know anything about it, but I, was, I had a few questions for Nick. I guess, is it like a low magic kind of uh, setting? Um, actually, from what I gather, it's I think the setting, as far as magic is concerned, is pretty much the same as other settings. I could be wrong on that. I don't know if it's necessarily a low uh, magic setting. And but, then, oh, go ahead. Sorry. But uh, yeah, no, continue if you got another question about it. Yeah. It, so it's 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 mainly uh, what, what's the word? Humana centric. Like like AD and D is uh you know I th- I think so I think it's it's pretty much humanocentric I don't recall any anything hearing about like elves or dwarves or anything like that There's various different races of humans huh. on Tacumel uh, I, I if I remember correctly the background is like this this world 
got cut off from the rest of the universe mm -hmm. and it was mm -hmm. it was colonized tens of thousands of years ago by humans and then somehow got cut off from the rest of the universe it's like its own little pocket universe uh, if, if I remember reading the thing about it uh, a while back um, the only thing I regret is I, uh, I, I remember someone getting a, a box set of the Empire of the Petal Throne years ago and I never got it it's a, it's. It, I think it's a pretty cool game setting. It's it's different, oh. definitely unique. This website is really amazing looking. Yeah, I. I and now that Matt mentioned, I think I went there one time. I'm gonna have to check out their AD and D conversions. Yeah, definitely. This is a great site. They did a lot of. Yeah, definitely go to the site and check it out. I won't ruin it for anybody. Yeah, he, um, a Barker I know was a huge influence in the early, uh, years of the role playing scene. In the in the in the late seventies, when everything was really just starting to kick off with D and D, and the other game systems were starting to emerge, like you know RuneQuest and Tunnels and Trolls. So, pretty pretty cool guy, you know. And he wrote some pretty good stuff too, as far as like his novelizations. He did some, some pretty cool stuff based in Tekken, though. Is, is so? Is this a series of books then? Yeah, I remember one series of books that he did that, as far as his fiction is concerned. It was called, I think it was called Man of Gold, and it's based in Tecumel. I think the Man of Gold was like a, it was like a robot made of gold or something like that. So, yeah, there's a little bit of uh, kind of like dying Earth, kind of post-apocalyptic feel to this planet. Uh, so, yeah, it's got a little bit of everything in there. Do, so. do you know, like offhand, like when those books were written? Empire of Petal Drone was like seventy five, seventy five, seventy six. Oh, okay, yeah, it was one of the early precursors to the to the campaign settings that came hmm. on later on, like with the Greyhawk Folio and and all the other campaign settings that came on afterwards. It was the it was the one first box setting that came out for for uh, a role playing game. I, I noticed that I, it was copyright seventy five and then two thousand ten by yeah. uh Barker on on the site here. So he must have done something in two thousand ten. Do, do they uh do they talk about uh that campaign setting in the in that book? Um no I don't know. I don't ha I don't have any of the fiction. I'm no, no, I mean in the, in the history of uh, uh, you, was playing it, uh, it at the world. Tim Casks wrote or something or uh, recommended. You know what? I don't know. I haven't gotten to that point yet. Oh. I, you know, I can actually look in the index here, and if it, they talk about Empire of the Petal Drone, I can here let you know. Uh, real quick, it was eighty four Flame Song eighty seven, uh, and then they have a couple books in two thousand three, two thousand two, and two thousand three. Yeah, so okay. Hmm. There's five books in total. You can look and. Yeah, actually, they talk about Empire of the Petal Drone in this book. Cool. Um, so I haven't gotten to that point yet. It's later on. Well, Nick, start like on page five hundred. So read faster, Nick. All right, I got a hundred more pages to go, but that's I'm. T this is how inclusive this book is. How it is the history of D and D and role early role playing games. You could All 700 pages of it. Issues about this world in Dragon 4, 11, 20, 24, 26, 31, and 34. Yeah. Hmm. It was all the all the Tim Cask issues yeah. that he was involved with. Yeah. And they're in White Dwarf 10 and 54. Oh, really? Yeah, I'm looking at the webpage. It says White Dwarf 10 and 54. Hmm. Okay. Cool. And they, yeah, Brett Slocum did most of the work for the uh, Excel format here for the sheet of where you could find where everything's located. Cool. Anyway, that's that. So I guess that's going to end Sage Advice. If you want to give us an email, staff at gmail.com or 570-865-4210, the hotline. That'll put us into our table matters next. Typical. Of all the evil creatures in the world, I'd like to find one with table manners. What are you kidding me? I've spent years cultivating the worst table manners on the planet. Table manners. Okay. Table manners. Two 
tonight. Table manners tonight. <laughs> Sounds like I'm doing tonight show. Table manners tonight. But what do we have, Jay? <laughs> Man, we have uh, this thing right here. This My head bobbing back and forth. Yeah, this actually was a topic that was talked about on our forums a little bit a couple weeks ago or last week. Mm -hmm. It's uh, basically we're going to review a module uh, about zero level characters because a lot of people were asking about well, what do you do with zero level characters. So you know, kind of want to throw this one out. Yeah, um, interrupting you. I I thought. This was really cool to do as far as um, uh, doing this module uh, in for Treasure Hunt by Aaron Alston. Who wrote the Rules Encyclopedia, right? I believe so. Fiber, yeah, I think he's a encyclopedia writer. Yeah. Go on. But um, what it does is gives um, rules for basically how to start zero level characters and just some guidelines on uh, what goes on the fr uh, making a uh, zero level character uh, what you need to do as far as race class alignment basically uh, uh, going right through it is as far as race you could be any race in a player's handbook uh, class don't worry about that you're you're going to determine that later. Um, so alignment, you'll determine later on as well. You, yeah, start, alignment, as you start basically as neutral uh, hit points. You can, you have a couple options either like enroll a D six or hit points, or you can start with a maximum of hit uh, six hit points, or you'll know, take the best out of three D six. So that's one thing to do languages. Just a standard you also, comment. Yeah. They speak common tongue. Uh, but if you're like a dwarf or elf or anything, obviously speak your uh, your your racial tongue as well. Uh, if you use alignment languages, you don't know alignment language yet. Right. Uh, I like the section on secondary skills. Uh, it brings up the Dungeon Master's Guide section on secondary skills on, you know, what your character might be doing as a profession. You know, it, and you can use that chart out of the Dungeon Master's Guide as um, as a uh, kind of a guideline for that. So um, you can either roll on the chart there, or you can, um, yeah, or maybe if you want to pick it too. I mean, you could roll it. And if you're lucky, you could be fisherman, you know, Boyer Fletcher, armor. Uh, I think stonemason's one of them. So. But it does say uh, you don't want to necessarily use it to, you know, shoehorn a character. Yeah, to shoehorn the character exactly. Uh, it could that secondary skill basically is could be helpful in certain situations that might arise in the, yeah. the adventure. It's just so, to help you out with role playing a little bit. Yeah, at least give you a background. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> money equipment, I wouldn't worry about it. <laughs> You're just gonna find. Whatever you could find on the in, in the adventure as the adventure, the, the course of the adventure goes, and as far as experience points and whatever, um, you start at negative five hundred experience points, and that's pretty much it. So you know, I might freak out about oh negative five hundred, but uh, this adventure will put you by the time you get to what they call episode four, you'll have enough experience to be almost level one as it is. So yeah, yeah, you do. So that's really much, pretty much the character creation. You can do wherever you, you want as far as where you want to put your ability scores are. In alignment's neutral, probably you got to start with six hit points. And you have negative 500 experience. Speaking about the hit points, I've noticed that when you get later on in this module in the DM section, they talk about that. When you go to pick your character class, alignment, and everything, I think if you're picking a magic user or an illusionist, they get a pretty good advantage as far as these hit points are concerned because you don't yeah. re-roll the hit points or take the, you know, make them re-roll. If they have six and say they have a bonus of, and they get eight total, they're having a magic user. That's starting it with eight hit points. Sure. Which sure. Is a very good bonus for a magic Huge user. Huge advantage. Of, and, or if you're a thief or assassin uh, yeah. character, I don't think you need the re-roll either. Mm -mm. So 
And they give a brief description at the beginning of where this adventure is set in some place called the Corn Archipelago. Mm-hmm. And um, they also have a thing at the very end of the module, a little bit more about the archipelago and where it might fit in a particular campaign setting. And really, I, I like what they say. It's like, you know, whatever campaign site, you can just plop it off anywhere off some coast that you have. You know, maybe change the names of certain things here and there if you want to. Uh, and, and boom, you're done. That's all you need to do. Oh, and uh, make sure each character picks one of the three weapon proficiencies allowed to start off. Oh, yes. Yeah. A you dagger, a staff, or what was it? Dart. Dart. Yeah. That's Dart, right. dagger, or quarter staff. Right. So, so what. Um, and then after that, it goes into the basics of the adventure. You want to talk about that there, Vince, the basic plot? Uh, well, it kind of starts off that you're all of these people from this island in this area, which uh, Nick had alluded to before. And each of your characters has a background. They're saying that your character was doing that profession, a trapper or whatever, a miner, maybe even a blacksmith, on these particular islands, islands, not irons. And what happens is it's kind of a you get kidnapped and become slavers on this pirate ship and they're going to bring you to this place, I guess, to probably sell you off as a slaver. And that's where it puts you at the beginning of the adventure. You're in the the bows of the ship chained to the wall. And then all of a sudden there's this big crash and the ship crashes into one of the islands where you're going to start the adventure and then the players have to escape. And they have no weapons. They have real no... They basically just have basic clothes on and... You have to do a lot of improvising to get off the ship, and your first objective is when you first get out of the chains, which is pretty easy to do, because the DM decides one of the chains has been broken by the uh, crash. Yeah, is the uh, player would get out of the chains, and then they would assist the other players getting out of the chains as well. And then their first objective is to sneak past this one pirate that's left on the ship alive. Right, uh, a half orc pirate, and he's all drunk. Yeah, because he killed the captain. Yeah. So you gotta either they either gotta elude him, maybe capture him, or probably more than likely you're gonna kill him. So through all of this, though, what the DM's job is doing is he there's a like a score sheet, right, on the back of like the character sheet more or less, and he's keeping track of all the things that your character has been doing. Yeah. Uh. It, as far as what it might pertain to a particular character class. If you attempt to do, for example, if you're attempting to do certain types of thief abilities for your character, and then it outlines in the uh, the uh, adventure, you know, what penalties do you have for trying to attempt these, and any successful time that you do it. I don't even think it has to be successful as long as you attempt it get like a little check mark or a little plus sign next to the name to the thief class there right yeah the, the dm's job is to kind of keep track of the players how they're so the players like oh i run an attack with my dagger you know you're going to check off something before, like he's a fighter because obviously he wants to jump in there and fight as opposed to a character that's like well i'm going to try to sneak past him or i'm going to try to climb over the wall and go from behind and backstab him or something mm-hmm. stab him in the neck but when he's not watching you know thief right there or assassin maybe right and, and they're keeping track of alignment as well yeah keeping a track of the alignment which i think is going to be a little more difficult for a dm to do i mean it has to be some overtly um obvious you know good or evil acts but that's going to be a little bit more i guess a little more subjective yeah and it's also this is also written for a new dm as well as new players yes so i was kind of looking at that going well how's a new dm really gonna and they kind of explained it a little bit how to judge the alignment in the DM section of this, but uh, I think a new DM might have a little bit of trouble with between the alignments, even reading them really good and maybe going online at this point and ch- just asking a lot of questions to people yeah. might help, but it's still kind of, it's hard. There's a lot of arguments when it comes to alignment. Yeah. I, I would say the best thing to do is leave the whole alignment thing. Let the characters pick. If, unless it's something evil and you don't want evil in your campaign. Right, right. Just let them pick. If they want to be a paladin and be lawful good, just keep a note of that and just be like, well, you know, you kind of went backstabbing and 
Uh, you stole the weapon from your friend when he was sleeping. A paladin really wouldn't do that, dude. You tell them so. Right. So <laughs> you'd be definitely out not to be a paladin. Yeah. Also, it, it also uh, the um, the adventure says that you cannot have a multi class. Well, yeah, because you're starting out pretty much as, as a zero level whatever. And right. I something about the adventure too. They assume that everybody's playing a human no matter what. Yeah, it does seem that way as well. It's like human, human, human. I'm like, well, what if they're playing an elf? I mean, yeah, what if they're playing uh, a dwarf? Yeah, shouldn't they say humanoid or something or demi human? Right. So, all this stuff that Vince and I are talking about, like alignment and the different abilities, that that's all being tracked by the DM. So, there's a little more bookkeeping that might have to be involved with, with some of this, but not so much, though. Just a little bit more. And that's okay because I think it makes it interesting to see how, like how, how this all develops through through the through the game. So, especially when you're you know you're crashed on the island and you're trying to get this drunk half orc out of your way. So, <laughs> yeah. So once you get you defeat him, however clever, clever method you do by like taking him full on, or maybe even you know, since Nick said he's drunk, wait until he passes out maybe, and then try beating him to death with the chains. Because you can take the chains and use them as weapons as well. Yeah, they they're not very good, but you can. Or you can find hunks of wood, you can probably use those as clubs. Right, at a negative four disadvantage, apparently. Right. And as far as the weapon proficiencies go, they have a rule in here for the DMs to say that if a player wants to pick up a certain weapon, for, for example, they find the sword later on, and they want to use it, allow them to use it, because this is the stage where the character is starting to develop, as they say. Mm -hmm. So they actually tell you that let the player use it at a disadvantage once or twice before they're really solid in combats before. And then they can add that to the weapon proficiencies. But you should warn them that by doing that, they're limiting their character choices along the way. Right. So if now, I did, go ahead, Nick. Yeah, I, I did see, though, that in that first, that part one of the adventure where they have to deal with this, this half Chris, the half work. Yeah. Um, if the party is smart, they'll search around the, 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 the wreck ship and they'll go into the aft hold. There is a weapon there that they can use. Yeah. There, there's a heavy crossbow and there's some crossbow bolts. So, and if they're lucky, they'll find a book and there's two spells in it. Oh yeah. True. I forgot about magic that. missile and sleep. Oh, how fortunate. <laughs> And uh, so anyway, if the character wants to pick up that weapon and use it, they're limiting themselves. So you, it kind of, it doesn't tell you, but I, I, I think as an experienced DM, I would say to the character, you know, before you consider that, you know, think that you're limiting yourself. You know, you don't, if you pick that sword, you're no longer allowing yourself to become a magic user or a cleric because they can't use edge weapons. And mm, uh, <laughs> uh, whatever. <laughs> Unless they're evil, all right. Anyway, sure, sure. Yeah, uh, continue. <laughs> so I would probably warn the player and say, you know, you want to use that sword? That's fine with me. And after a couple combats, you'll be proficient in using it. But that's gonna kind of turn you to only be able to be a fighter or maybe a thief or assassin or. Uh... Well, I think when it comes to the cleric thing, I think if they decide to do that, all they do is have to, f if you stick with that particular restriction. The, the, the restriction for clerics, all they have to do is forswear all the uh, edged weapons, and then they become a cleric. And I think that'd be, you yeah, know? well, you're losing a proficiency slot for weapons, though. Though, right. yeah, well, then that's the price you pay. And then you also have to make sure you remind the players if you get proficient in too many weapons, <laughs> you will rule out certain classes as well. Mm -hmm. So you'll probably want to point out the fact once the players figure out, hey, if I play around with the sword, I get proficient in it, they're all probably going to play around with every weapon they touch. At yeah. which point you're going to end up with a party of nothing but fighters. So, Well, they, yeah. That's certainly true. You could rule it to the fact of saying, okay, you're going to pick up the weapon, you want to try it out, go ahead and use it for this adventure. By the time you reach level one, decide if you're going to continue with that or just drop it. Yeah, maybe that's, that's an easy way to do it. But that brings a, actually a good segue to the, I guess what they call episode two, the battle on the hill. This right. is where they're going to come into the contact with two 
basically warring factions. You have orcs and goblins. And the, the orcs and the goblins in this particular part of the campaign world, at least in the archipelago, the orcs are are very much like pirates. I guess the goblins are Ooh. two, not so much that they say. Basically, they're two different types of warring factions, and they're they're fighting each other on around this hill. And there's a the the party comes across this. You see, they see the goblins and orcs fighting, and there's several, I guess, rounds of combat that they're able to observe from a particular vantage point. And they could choose to either you know attack at a certain point. Um, Sneak around because they all there's also some they, they observe some old man who's like bound. I, I don't know if he's gagged or not, I don't remember, but he's bound. He's like in some like little gully somewhere, it's like he's like a prisoner. So, this is where I don't know. They could they could observe this battle for quite some time. There's one really cool option, <laughs> it's called bouldering. Basically, there's an outcrop of boulders that they could dump on the whole thing of orcs and goblins and take out most of them in one fell swoop. That's probably almost your best option. Yeah, or yeah, or they could sit there and wait until the battle's pretty much over and just pick off the rest. Yeah, that's yeah. You could do that as well. I I don't know. I I looked at this section. I almost wanted to think of like. Now, how boring will it be for them just to wait it out? You know what I would think that I would almost do? Just kind of like a little twist on it. I would say, okay, guys, uh, hold on. You guys, you work, uh, you play the orcs. You guys play the goblins. Now let's fight it out. <laughs> yeah, you could do that. I would I would think that would be a cool way of doing it as well, just so the players want to get bored. You know, I would just kind of sum it up and say you stand there for a while you watch this faction of these two wars going on, a couple fall here and there as time passes until you finally see there's only one or two of them left fighting mm-hmm. this bloody battle to the end. What do you do? Do you continue to watch? Or, and then if they said they continue to watch, I would just say, well, then you finally see the last one slay the last. I would just decide an orc or goblin slay the last one. And then the last one left would probably start looting. And that's their opportunity to do something. Yeah, you could do that as well. And this is where there's an opportunity to get some some armor and weapons, battle axes, daggers, bardiche, um, yeah. some padded armor, uh, some spears. So lots of opportunities to get some weapons and equipment. And battle axe, yeah. Yep. Spear, dagger, like you said. And then when you find the old man, he tells you of, uh, what is it, the old manor of the Sea King where... There's going to be lots of loot, so there's the plot hook right there, <laughs> which is which leads you into episode three. But at the end of each each little episodes, which we we forgot to mention, they give experience every episode, mm-hmm. and for every weapon and piece of equipment you gather, you get experience for that as well. For example, the battle axe that you pick up, which is for each, so you can acquire five experience points for every battle axe you pick up, which is limited to. Uh, Let's see, there's four there, and there's another that's seven. So there's seven battle axes, so that's 35 experience points right there. Yeah. So it's not that bad, so if the DM's sitting there, oh my god, that's a lot of experience. No, it's not really. Not really, because you're starting at negative 500. Yeah. And then they suggest giving experience point bonuses to individual characters that think up clever methods and clever ways to attack. Yeah. Which is another, but you only give them 20 points for that each time right. or something inventive. But like Nick says, it goes on to the next chapter and <laughs> the Temple of the Goddess is next where they go, right? Yeah. 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 This is where um, they are led by this uh, man. I really hate his name. What is it? Uh, Keystake. Yeah. Keystake. I hate that name. Sounds like a restaurant. I know. Welcome to Keystake Restaurants. Where we serve uh, steak all day, rare and fresh. Well, I'll just call him Bob. So you find Bob. No, don't call him Bob. Okay, Joe. You find okay. Joe. No, not Joe. It's insulting. Phil? How about Nick? No. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so 
Nick, and well, you find this old guy. Yeah. I'll just call him the old guy. So you find the old guy, and he's gonna lead you eventually to, or hopefully to the, to the old manor of the Sea King. But there's also this temple devoted to a particular goddess, and that could be whatever goddess that if you have the deities and demigods, they give some. Um, oh no no no. The they call it, I'm sorry, legends and lore because yeah. it was after 1983. Yes. But they give some uh, suggestions. I find it interesting that they give any suggestions when it comes to uh, World of Greyhawk fantasy campaign setting. Uh-huh. Shocker! I wonder why. Because it was 1986, and Gygax was already given the boot. To boot. Yeah. So they like if you Babylonian, they say Ishtar, uh, Celtic. Say Bridget, Isis, Athena, and blah blah blah. <laughs> so, uh, also along with this, going to this temple, you're you're searching through it. You find the hall of the goddess, and eventually, well, the the, the, the temple's desecrated. Is like yeah, what happens? Yeah, the warring factions of orcs and goblins have gone through this place and defaced it, defiled it. Picked it clean, everything like that. Yeah. But, but. at one point, the, the, when the player characters decide to you know, rest up, they feel that this is a safe place, one of them is going to be visited by this goddess, either in a dream or in a vision while they're on guard duty or something. This, no, not really in a dream. I didn't. Yeah. It said they they wake. She wakes them up. Yeah. Rest to sleep with a sleep spell. According to what I remember here. Yeah, I'm. So, I must have misread it then. Yeah, they said she for the first few minutes of the conversation. The other players are out because of the sleep spell spell that she cast upon them that keeps that works up until they fail their roll pretty much. So. Mm-hmm. So this is going to happen regardless. Yeah. <laughs> But only for the first couple of sentences, they say. Right. And then she says that she's been watching them. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so because of all the things that have been happening on the island, she is going to destroy the island within... It's a great role-playing opportunity to see if any one of the players wants to become a a cleric type character. Yeah, actually, yeah, this is the point where you're going to find out um which of the players their their character is going to choose to be uh go down the path to be the cleric because it, you would actually think, you know what? That's probably the hardest one to determine. <laughs> of all the different character classes, which one of them is going to be more of a cleric type? This is where the role play opportunity comes to maybe determine that. And you get something really, really cool out of this whole situation if you respect the goddess. Oh, yeah. Everybody gets healed up. Well, uh, not only that. But um, you get the divine favor. Oh, that's right. If you curry the favor of the of the goddess mm-hmm. um, during the rest of the adventure... The character gets an automatic 20 on a die roll where things are at their worst. So if it's like maybe a to hit or a saving throw, that's like a real crucial situation determined by the DM. He'll say, nope, that's a 20. And the reverse, too, if you disrespect the goddess and you piss her off, yeah, reverse happens to you. You get the reverse of divine favor and she'll step in and regardless of what you roll, the DM will look at you and, and say, uh, I don't care what the dice says, you automatically fail. Yeah, even and it's at a <laughs> crucial time. <laughs> yeah, even if it's a 20, he the DM is allowed to override that. Yeah, so like if that sword blow was going to like kill you, but it only does one point of damage, you had two hit points, you, the DM could say, no, <laughs> it did three points of damage. <laughs> yeah, and the weapon you're using or whatever happens starts glowing in the color of the goddess. So you yes. know what's going on. So that might be the cue to your that player character. Oh yeah. The one well, thing, I'll probably become a cleric. The one thing I did not think that was fair for zero level characters was a stick of ghoul in this situation. Yeah, I didn't like that either. I'm like, there's one ghoul in here. I'm like, really? That's hiding that... in like a chimney. Mm-hmm. 
And, you uh, know, that but, didn't seem right to me. I mean, even with player characters having padded armor and, say, uh, a sword and uh, a dagger or whatever, a, a ghoul with seven hit points, armor class six, with uh, three attacks. And paralyzing touch if yeah. you're not an elf. Which could wipe out the whole entire party if everybody has a lot of bad rolls. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, this is where your divine favor is really important. True. But if nobody warrants a divine favor, then, you know, yeah. I guess the goddess will pick somebody to help. But And there is a chance that when the ghoul paralyzes you, he's for some reason stringing you up because he wants to make you a tasty morsel for later on. Mm, yummy meat snack. He wants to make you into beef jerky, apparently. Because he wants to snap into a Slim Jim. Yeah. Yeah. And the guy's name is Jim. So that Ooh. makes sense. But I like how the ghoul comes out. It kinda, it, the ghoul is a thief, so he gets to sneak around 40%. I know. That was even, that's even more, de- uh, no, that's even more mean. So that will lead us to episode four when he gets to the manor of the Sea King. Yay. Yay. <laughs> So um, the players will get, uh, I guess, a map of the manor from the old guy. <laughs> the old guy, yeah. Keystaker, his name Keystake. What a weird name. I, yeah, I don't know. It's probably randomly generated. No, uh, um, from what? <laughs> from stake and keys. I don't know. Uh, but, yeah, they they talk about the behavior of the orcs and, and goblins. They, they do little raids into the manor, but they don't do like out and out battles, try to destroy each other. That whole, like, you know, talk about the whole, like, you know, pirate code honor amongst these sort of thing. Yeah. And, they, and like, they don't attack each other. They allow each other a certain amount of time to go into this manor and do the raids and pull out without attacking each other. Cause they're, the honor among thieves, like you said, and then, but if anybody's caught sneaking in and stealing stuff and they realize it, then they start this little mini battle and they start attacking, and that's when you'll see yeah. it happen. But it's odd because they're all kind of just standing outside, kind of like, I'm going to watch you, but I'm going to watch you while you're watching. Mm-hmm. Make sure you're not going in to steal. And they kind of just stand outside and stare at each other. <laughs> yeah. So the, the, the player characters, the party has to figure out how they're going to get access. And they give some suggestions on like creating a distraction, uh, um, somehow maybe sneaking in. Uh, So they give a couple of those ideas. And then you get to some other uh, key points of interest once they gain access to the manor. So, you know, they could go to the, the, one of them, they get to the queen's quarters. They encounter some, uh, some goblins. One, Important was when they get to the king's quarters, there are some magic items that they are able to find. There's a a wand of magic detection, Mm -hmm. uh, a dagger plus two pluses three versus creatures larger than man size, and a potion of super heroism. Hmm. So huge uh, help to this zero level party that's going through. And then you you can find key sticks, uh, quarters and everything. Mm -hmm. Which he's all upset about because it's all destroyed and it's a mess. Yeah, and then um, there are some points um, also actually in the library. There's an interesting area when you uh, you would think that you you know they're going to search through the books, but there's none of them are good. They're all ruined. Yeah, but there is a uh, like a like a wooden plaque, eight foot tall wooden plaque on the wall and depicts a, um, uh, it's a, it's a release sculpture showing a harpooner drawing back his weapon to release a, a to a release at a distant whale. It looks like the plaque was pulled away a little bit mm-hmm. from the wall. It looks like they were searching for like maybe a secret door or, you know, like a, maybe a safe in the wall. I don't know. But if they look at the plaque uh, long enough, they'll see something rather odd. The harpoon seems to be a separate piece from the rest of the figures. So they take that harpoon off, yep. it's a javelin of lightning. <laughs> and then they find the secret passage to go down into the catacombs. Yes. Which the old man has been leading them to, which will end the, that episode pretty much. Yeah, and this episode, episode four, 
Um, this is probably at the point, and they do say at this point in adventure, where the player characters are going to be first level by this point. Most of them, particularly, yeah. yeah, most of them should be, uh, particularly finding these magic items. The only thing I disagree with mm -hmm. is separating the experience point values of the magic items evenly amongst the party. I I think that whoever gets the magic item gets the XP for it. Yeah, normally that's how it's played, but I guess for this module they wanted to make sure everybody gets up on a level, so what are you going to do? Not play it that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you give the experience points to whoever's actually just using the magic items. At that point, if one person just hoarded them all, yeah. they'll level a lot quicker than everyone else. Well, help to get the wand of magic detection, they go up 2,500 experience points. Right. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah. So at that I point... Guess you can, I guess you could do it You could in, theoretically end up with level two characters at this point if one person what? hoarded all of them. No, well, I don't think one person would do that, though. Well, technically, you can if you go by the rules of the book. You can only go up one level per adventure, no matter what. Ah, DMG guide, uh, I believe, says you go up, you go up one level and one experience points over that level, and that's about it. That's all. You, no matter how much experience you get, and that's about it, or something to that effect. I just know you can only go up one level per adventure, no matter what. Right. If you follow Guy Gax's rule from the book, and hit yourself in the face with the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Ow. <laughs> Which, Leap. after that, they lead to, like you said, the catacombs. Where the old man has been plotting and scheming to get everybody into to pretty much kill everybody. And he goes crazy. Yeah, he turns from this like person that's willing to help and awesome and nice. I mean, he did a little moaning and complaining when he found out his room was destroyed. So the characters had to be like, shut up, old man. Shut up, old man. Yeah, shut up, old man. Good day. Anyway, and he has to, he starts losing his mind. Like, he completely does a 180 now and becomes like this insane, sinister character by sealing the characters in the mind by pulling a lever. I don't know about sinister, but he does go like yeah, crazy. Maybe. He just. And he gives a traditional long speech, too. Yes. There's a long page and a half speech that he gives on like how he basically prayed with the Sea King's magic ring for somehow to preserve the Sea King and uh, the Queen forever. And boy, do you find out how. And, and, and <laughs> is, um, when he traps the players in the mine, there's two things here. He does this purposely so nobody could steal anything from the catacombs and ever get in and to keep the orcs and the goblins out and to kill the player characters, obviously, but if he already died, say, like, there was a raid inside the castle and that you, the old man was too loud and he got killed, he had drawn out a map that yeah. lead them down a path that will still trigger the falling of the cave. So either way, they're going to be trapped in there. All right. I just don't like the whole, like, he pulls the lever and they get trapped and he goes, <laughs> I'm crazy. <laughs> Very I just thought, why don't we just have, like, a natural collapse of the cave and... We can make this nice, likable character still nice and likable. No, no, you have to get rid of him. Oh, okay, fine. No, sorry, Nick. Yeah, well, well, okay. So, do you want they, the steak sticking around? Do you, Nick? I just don't like his name. Well, let's <laughs> kill him. Okay, fine. Yeah. He dies. It's worth 16 experience points. Maybe an earthquake caused by the dragon cult causes the cave to collapse. No, 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 no. That's another adventure. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> Matt. So this is where like things get really like pressed for time because as the got one god has said, whichever it may be, you know, time's running out. She's going to destroy the island because of all the orcs and goblins that defiled the place. So she's like, you know what? I'm just going to destroy it to heck with it. Yeah. So she gives you an extra like 24 hours and says that you have, you have a chance to get off the island. If you're worthy, you'll make it off. If not, oh, well, too bad. You're going to die anyway. Yep, and this is where they're going to get their chance to get off the di uh, the island is by breaking through to the crypt of the king and queen and um and her and their and their, I guess their son, their prince's son, but he is in detail because when they get to the crypt of the king and queen, <laughs> guess what? They're zombies. 
<laughs> so, <laughs> what happened was that uh, the old man, Keystake, when he was at the end, like this all happened 60 years ago, the ring that the uh, Sea King had was, yes, as you guessed it, a ring of wishes. And he <laughs> took the ring off and wished for to um, <laughs> preserve his king and queen forever. So some, obviously, the other adventure, the DM was a maniacal guy, probably like Vince. Hey. So, yep, yep, preserve them as zombies. So yes. <laughs> that's the royal greeting that they get. <laughs> Well, you know, how would you handle that? Preserve them? Why don't we put them in a jar with jelly? I have no idea, all right? I don't know. Stick them in a barrel full of salt? There you go. So they're salt zombies. Mm, well, no, you just stick them in a barrel of salt and keep the wish for yourself. Oh. But, well, it's better than them, like, coming back as, like, you know, liches, I suppose. <laughs> so, which would be out of the scope of this adventure. So what they have to do is in one of the burial crypts, they find... <gasps> A boat. <laughs> oh, so this is episode six you're talking about. Yes, episode six. At this point, after episode five in the catacombs, the characters pretty much have to choose what they're, where they're going as far as class and alignment now at this point. Even though there wasn't much, they pretty much should be at the point where they have reached zero experience points and they have to do any revisions on their character and pick their class at this point in alignment. Yep. And the DM's decision overall is the final judgment. You want the players say otherwise, you pretty much have the final arbitrary decision there. So whatever the DM says, you should go with unless they're going to really fight and, you know, kick their feet on the ground. And then you don't want to really play with them anyway. So, right. And you just tell them, baby, suck your thumb. When here's your bottle. Sorry. No. But generally, if the character really wants to play something, you'd say, all right, well, here, fine. Yeah. And they could come out with a pretty good haul if they break through, get the boat out to the shore, and uh, they see the storm that comes through, a bunch of tornadoes destroy the island. The end. Dun, dun, dun. But they come come out with some pretty good loot uh, from that's found in the uh, the Sea King's chamber. There's, like, some dinnerware worth a 1,000 gold. The prince's ch- arms and armor, the chainmail, shield, bastard sword, a dagger. There's a, a chest of gold with 600 gold. Uh, Why the the all- galley is worth 10,000 gold. Why are they all glowing in that one picture when they're sneaking out and the king is rising to attack them? Because he's enchanted zombie. No, not the king himself. The players look like they're glowing. Uh, I think that's just how the artwork is. Oh, okay. And... Um, yeah, the scale mail plus one and a mace plus one. So, yeah, and then after that, it's up to you what happens to the what the player characters where they go and you know how they uh, live out the rest of their lives and they start off as first level wow. characters. The Prince's galley is worth ten thousand gold. Yeah, yeah. ten thousand gold right there. Yeah, these are going to be some super powerful first level characters by the time they're. I done. know because they have like. A uh, few magical weapons, uh, some magic armor. More gold uh, than they could ever spend at first level. Yeah, and they got a ship. Well, you could be a evil DM and say they get on the ship, they, if they start escaping, and then you notice the boat is starting to sink because you're too heavy. Or that the, <laughs> it's been dry rotted or something like that, and it starts to sink. Now the adventure finally finishes up, and you're happy, dappy, there's the end of the adventure, but... Let's just say something goes wrong, Nick. Yeah, let's just say something goes wrong. Some things aren't right. Basically, they give a, a there's a guideline for the DM when things go wrong, and that's Appendix 1, if things go wrong. <laughs> and what it is is some guidelines, some rules, if you will, for the DM to say if basically if the player characters do something stupid. <laughs> yeah. And it outlines all the different chapters and say, okay, this is where something really stupid could happen if the, if the player characters do it. Here's another section where they could do something stupid, and this is how you can handle it. So, And this is really a section for your inner, your, your beginner DM. Yeah. So they give some guidelines there. So, And that's where it also says, you know, this is an adventure essentially where you don't want to necessarily kill off the characters unless they're doing something dumb. 
Then they go on to Appendix 2, uh, a brief outline of the Corin Archipelago and how you can incorporate this maybe into a uh, existing campaign world that you may have. And it's a little bit of history about it. And they give you the quick monster area, which I kind of think is cool with the little check boxes so you don't have to bother writing on a piece of paper or everything. Just as they get damaged, check, check, check. Yeah. And cross it out. And um, I also like how for for uh, putting in a current campaign setting, it says it's just one, it's one paragraph. It's not difficult to integrate the archipelago in any already existing campaign. Just plant the island chain offshore in some remote point of your existing game world, adjust the names of the surrounding continental nations, and you have it made. I like that. Yeah. So, um, in fact, for those of us like myself, I like to use the World of Greyhawk Fantasy Campaign Center. I think it'd be a real good spot if you could incorporate, say, into the Lendor Islands off the uh, southeastern portion of the map. I think that would be a really good spot the plot the this archipelago and I think it it fits in with the kind of the 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 area and the inhabitants of the uh, uh, of that region of of of, uh, of the world of Greyhawk. So and you just got to change some things as far as like you can use the gods and goddesses from World of Greyhawk then and yeah. incorporate that into the larger uh, Lendor Isles campaign setting if you uh, Lendor Isles mini campaign that uh, you can use, you know, like Bone Hill later on and Assassin's Knot or whatever. Well, so just use the whole, it's my fantasy world and this is a fantasy game, so who the heck really cares where it's located and have them get on their little boat and go to your new world. Yeah, but I'm the lazy DM, remember? Oh, that's true. You're a lazy DM. I forgot. Yeah, I don't design my own game world <laughs> because I'm too lazy. <laughs> Overall, it's a pretty interesting story. It's an yeah. interesting way to start an adventure. The rules are pretty much laid out for you really well to get the players started for new DMs, for new players. Mm -hmm. I definitely recommend looking this over if you want to, because I know a lot of people are like, well, if I want to start my characters at little level zero. Yeah. A lot of people were asking that on the forum. So as they asked, it was kind of perfect timing. They were like, hey, by the way, we're doing an adventure on zero level characters next week. And by the way, this is advent adventure is available now for download from dndclassics.com. That's correct. With, so you can get it. And Nick, since you're more familiar with modules than I am, because I don't really use them, mm -hmm. where would you where would you go from N4? What would you go to next? Um, like like I said, if I was using like World of Greyhawk, I would probably incorporate into that whole Lendor's Isle series. I would go with Secret of Bone Hill, maybe. So that's N4, nine. That's L1. L1. Uh, Secret of Bone Hill, then then you can incorporate. L2, 3, and 4, then that whole mini campaign setting. Um, I guess if you wanted to. Um, isn't the N, isn't N1, 2, and 3, aren't they novice level modules too? Yeah, N1 is against the Cult of the Reptile God. Yeah, so there you go. You could go that route as well. And um, I guess it really any first through third level adventure that you may have. I mean, there's no real hard core way that you should do it. I mean, since the the party has a ten thousand gold piece value galley, if they take that, <laughs> they could sail pretty much anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, I, I mean, those are a couple suggestions. I think that would be good. Yeah, I guess you can give the players. I mean, I don't know. I don't think I'll really give them a ten thousand gold galley there. I mean, like Nick, like Nick said, like Matt said, that's get some really powerful, rich first level characters. So. Yes, it does. It's, it's it's a Monty Hall, you know, campaign. I guess in some respects, it's, it is a lot. Yeah. Yeah. But th that's, you know, that's the way they set it up. And yeah. this you, is. Uh, go ahead, man. You could actually bring the story full circle and have them be attacked by a slaver ship in their new galley. Yeah, you could do that. Yeah, you could, that's possible. I mean, and then at that point, they get captured again and we repeat. 
<laughs> oh, you know what you could do? Rinse and repeat the module, yeah. <laughs> you know, maybe this ship, if they go to one of the other islands, because it was one of the Sea Kings, uh, this was the Sea King's galley, they could say, um, you can't take this. Uh, we're going to preserve this in memory of the Sea King. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah. You or, could do that too. That's, or they'd be like, you desecrated the tomb. This was in the final resting place of the Sea King, and you took it. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> Even worse. <laughs> kind of reminds me of like the end of Goonies, the ship out there floating by itself, yeah. and all the golds on it, and they're all standing there watching it. And, uh, you know. Chunk. Yeah, Chunk. Sloth love Chunk. I don't know. I just don't like the ending too much. No, I don't either. It's like it makes them to give them a ten thousand gold piece value ship. <laughs> well, I, I don't mean to like raise edition flag wars here, but if you see who wrote it, it's kind of leading into the second edition. Second edition, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're it's 19, This was written nineteen eighty six. It came out nineteen eighty six. Yeah. So you're kind of getting. They were already talking about a second edition around this time. And that's what I felt. Eighty six, eighty seven. They were already talking about an, a second edition AD&D &D, and in fact I think it was around this time yeah you it might have been a little bit later but I remember Dragon had like a questionnaire to fill out what you would like to see in a second edition and all that so yeah we were, we're getting on the, the twilight years of first edition right here when they started making things a little bit more mainstream and more heroically powerful with, with yes. second edition and I'm not trying to raise the war flag here but that's just my feelings and I apologize to those people that enjoy second edition don't apologize this is a first edition uh, podcast Exactly, but if they want if they want second edition, they can go to that other one. What's it called? Thacko's Hammer, yeah, yeah something like that. Thack Zero, Th yeah, Th Th the Thack Zero's, Zero's Hammer podcast, yeah. <laughs> they can go with the book that I just threw across the room before, <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't do that to insult anybody. I just it got I got annoying that it kept falling off the shelf. Yes, on we are busting the other podcast shelves. Oh, I don't want to bust the other podcasts. I love them; they're very nice. I know. We we. We bust on each other. It's okay. <laughs> so that's going to be just going to wrap up some table manners. At the end of everything, after we speak of everything, we'll give you a uh, review as far as what we thought overall. So that was just the story. And I think we're going to head into some creature feature theater next. C can I add one thing, though? Oh, just, sorry. Um, there's, a, there's an article in Dragon 51 that covers the zero level uh, characters. Oh, really? Um, yeah. one. Yeah, it's it's in was it Leomund's Tiny Hunt? However, that however ah, that's yes, Leonard Lakofka. Yeah. Um, and it's pretty extensive. It goes. I'm I'm kind of a fish out of water with the with the zero level character thing. So, but uh, yeah, there's that, and you know, obviously now you can get it on archive.org. So, which is yeah. awesome. That's yeah, tell me about it. And 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 one more point. Uh, are you guys familiar with the Ultimate uh, Dragon Magazine Index article? It's in uh, issue one twelve. Mm -mm. No. It 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 it's oh, um it's an index. That's right. Yeah. It's it's pretty amazing. Obviously, it only covers up to you know issue like one eleven, but um, you know everything before that. It's it's a lot. So just to throw that out there, yeah. like uh, for doing research and whatnot. That's oh, yeah, I mean. absolutely. Yeah. It's like I love the Dragon decks. That's what I use when I look for anything because it covers every issue of Dragon. So yep. it's good, glorious site for anyone that's just looking for additional reading material. Now that you can get every Dragon magazine for free legally. Dun, dun, dun. Great googly moogly. Excellent. Are you saying that I put... An abnormal brain into a seven and a half foot long gorilla! Creature Feature Theater. It's alive! It's alive! All right, so this week in Creature Features, we're going to talk about orcs. And, um,. I kind of wanted to. It's not going to be your dad's orcs, is is what I was going for. Um, this isn't your dad's wait, orcs. We're talking yeah. about. Yeah. Do they have pig faces? Yes, yes, yes. By all means, you got to have the pig face. Um, of course. So there's there's 
two aspects that I was going to uh, kind of talk about. One is, you know, if you, if you read up on the orcs, you know, they're they're kind of shrouded in mystery that actually, you know, came about, um, which leaves it open for the DM to kind of, you know, uh, formulate their own kind of origin. And the other thing is their... Um, how do I put this on a family podcast there? The, well, um, they'll just mate with anything basically, which leaves them, you know, open for, you know, kind of being uh, malleable, you know, kind of, you can kind of make your own kind of orc, mm -hmm. um, which I guess, I guess, Nick, you're going to talk about that with the, uh, was it the desert orc? Yeah, I found about the desert orc, but uh, yeah, I'll talk about that a little bit shortly, but yeah, continue on. Yeah. Please. So, yeah. So, um, so, you know, it seems like you can kind of uh, make your own custom orc. And also, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Gazetter. Um, it's the uh, orcs of Farn or Thar, I think. Do you guys familiar yeah, with that? For for original, uh, for basic D&D, &D, yep. Yeah, they they actually have um, an AD&D &D conversion in there. But I just, I just they kind do. of. They do. Yeah. I um, didn't know that. No, neither did I. But oh. it's, it, it's a. It's a pretty amazing publication, that one. Um, there's a lot of information, and you you know you can get orc names, and they they kind of go on and they say like there's like yellow orcs, there's red orcs. I think there might be black orcs. Um, oh, cool. So I was thinking like yeah, you can kind of uh, you know adjust hit dice, you can adjust uh, AC, you know um, that kind of a thing, and then yeah, with region wherever they're they're from, we'll kind of. Uh, kind of tailor them and maybe give them like a, a special attack or two, you know, not, not nothing, you know, that great. I mean, we're talking about orcs. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and I, I mean, I haven't done it, but I, I'll probably make out like um, just like a, you know, a PDF of kind of, you know, like a orc generator, so to speak. And I started with um, like, if you have like a smaller orc would be like, you know, the, the orc in monster manual is, is a one hit dice creature. So I thought like, well, one minus one, you'd be like a smaller orc. And then you'd kind of give them maybe other things. Maybe they'd be kind of like, uh, kind of like a thief of some sort in a way, you know, give, give them a couple thieving spells and be more along the lines of like setting traps and whatnot, just kind of being, you know, kind of like the little guy, but who's finding other ways, you know, in a, in a big world kind of a thing. And then, you know, obviously hit dice one, hit dice one plus one, mm -hmm. hit dice one plus two, and so on. And up to, I, I thought two hit dice is probably the limit you're going to want to go um, with an orc. Whoa. Um, so there's that, just kind of making your own kind of, you know, kind of uh, breed of orc, so to speak. So, you know, I mean, everyone for the most part uses orc, so this kind of gives them gives your players a little something else, you know, to, to fight. Um, so that was the one part. And the other part is in uh, Dragon uh, issue 62, they cover uh, the, uh, the gods of the orcs. And um, it's these five other lesser gods. And it was written by Roger Moore. And so what I found is in so... For example, there's the um, the the only goddess in in the the, the orc pantheon is uh, Luthic. Yeah, and she's ugly. <laughs> yeah, she's got these long claws. So they mention in the article her clan by name, which is Vile Rune. So if you look in the monster manual, it's um, when they have like they give you examples of clan names. Vile Rune is there. I'll be doggone. <laughs> so so if you. If you look at more of the uh, the clan names, they kind of uh, correspond to the other gods that are in this dragon magazine. Um, so what I kind of did was I I, I kind of wanted to make them like you know the the big bad guy. Like you'd have like a shaman who'd be you know pretty much have hit dice and hit points of a, a chieftain. But then they'd have, you know, obviously uh, cleric spells and, um, you know, it's not going to, you know, be, I don't know, maybe up to like a fourth level or fifth level, you know, character could handle this maybe. Um, but all of them kind of are tailored to, you know, their gods. So, for example, there's the um, the god uh, your trust. I think that's how it's pronounced. It's the, um, the lesser god of death and plague. 
Mm-hmm. So I made those shamans, um, you know, up to fifth level. Then that's going from the uh, Deity and Demi got a book with, uh, what, Grumish? Is that how it's pronounced? Yeah, Grumish. Yeah. Ooh, you know, they, I... yeah, um, they can um, advance to fifth level. So I kind of put that as the ceiling um, for the rest of them. And there's, there's like two other shamans that can only advance to third level. But anyway, so with this God of plagues and disease, um, I thought that, you know, if you're a fifth level cleric, you get a third level spell. And, uh, so, uh, you know, animate dead is third level. So bingo, you can make, you know, skeletons and zombies if you want. And then you've got like, you know, something else to fight. And, you know, for, for this God, his symbol is a skeleton. So that made kind of sense. Like, well, okay. So they can make skeletons if they want, you know, Mm -hmm. um, and then I kind of went on with that and, you know, obviously, so, you know, uh, orcs get a minus one in full daylight. So I gave pretty much across the board, except for one, uh, shaman, everyone gets like a darkness spell. Oh, okay. Um, so I kind of, yeah, tailored, everyone's kind of got the different like set of spells and then there's, um, and then there's, yeah, there's a the clan, a leprous hand and the God is kind of leprous in, in, uh, I don't know, appearance. So that kind of made sense to use the leprous hand clan for that God. Oh, that was that one. Your truce, the yes. white handed. Yeah. Yeah. He's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, he looks like something out of the movie evil dead. dead totally. I die. And, and it's, it's pretty nasty because, uh, the, his clerics or shamans wear, like skins, sewn skins for their armor. It doesn't really oh, affect their armor class. So that's it's Amy Gum. Pretty, pretty <laughs> awesome. It puts um, the nice skin or it gets the hose. And then there's there was only within the text, there was only really one plot hook, but it but it still worked. And they say that sometimes um when the orcs fall upon like disease or plague, they'll uh increase sacrifices you know, to the God. So, you know, that kind of, you could, you know, have them raiding a village, you know, for more, you know, slaves, for more, you know, people to sacrifice to the God so that they, um, you know, kind of rid themselves of the plague. And also what's kind of built in um, with orcs is they really encourage fighting amongst, you know, uh, inner tribes or whatever, you know, kind of like the Darwinian thinning of the herd. So I was thinking you could have mm-hmm. a, a different tribe kind of causing that plague, like, you know, contaminating like their water supply or whatever. But, you know, the orcs wouldn't know about that. So that could also, you know, depending upon how you want your players want to, you know, uh, handle it, they could either, you know, discover that and maybe even, <laughs> I don't know, help out the orcs in some way or just, you know, try to destroy them all kind of a thing. Um so basically, um, yeah, I, I kind of went through through these five uh, gods and kind of you know uh, shaped the, the the shamans kind of a thing. Um, that's yeah, pretty that's, cool. That's a good way of doing that. Never would have thought of that. So that's uh, I don't know. I could go on with each each individual god, but I guess I could I could say that for the for the PDF file, and you can it'll be kind of self explanatory. But that just kind of give you like an overview oh. of what I had in mind. That's pretty cool. I like that. So cool. it's like you know each different like uh, clan uh, or tribe, they're going to have a particular god associated with it, and that's 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 a pretty cool looking like uh, how you can make like a really uh, detailed orc society. Definitely. I guess. Yeah, I guess kind of going along with that, just like different variations of orcs, um, is one thing that I found in one of the few issues of White Dwarf Magazine I have, um, way back in issue 64 of White Dwarf, and this was back in April of 1985, there's their Fiend Factory section, and they had this uh, section of... Uh, where they talked, it was like a little blurb about a, a, a old desert oasis city called Trogar, and they had a whole bunch of like creatures that were statted out for D and D for them. One of them is one called the Desert Orc, and this orc, and it does have a pig face, 
And they have like they're sandy brown in color. They have pinkish snouts, and and dark brown hair. They're normal cousins. They have like well developed tusk like lower canines, and some are known to have a short horn based on their foreheads. They have um, the desert orc tribes. They're very hateful towards other tribes, and they uh, the desert orcs pr- prime principally fight however not for tribal respect or honor not for greed but simply because they delight in seeing creatures other than themselves in great pain <laughs> so, they're pretty darn mean uh, uh as far as like different types of they have a you know blurb about their chiefs and tr- uh chieftains um what sort of sub chiefs make up the uh their uh tribes basically what it comes down to if you have 20 or more there'll be a group master of 14 hit points and one to two champions there's a sub chief um their lairs are generally like a wooden stockade with uh, uh, log huts they have watchtowers and they're usually defended with heavy and light catapults and um, possibly some ballistas and here's a cool thing. 65% chance of the tribe using one to six giant scorpions as guards. So <laughs> I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> so you got these giant orcs and they got, uh, they got, uh, um, you know, they got orcs with uh, scorpions as guards. I thought that was pretty slick. So anyway. Well, that's interesting. Got... Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, no, one of the cool things about this, Orc though, is they have um, they have like a magical ability. Uh, they can create a uh, they can control the sand around them. The desert orc can, with the swaying of his hands, cause dust or sand particles in a twenty foot radius to rise in a swirling hypnotic pattern. The effect is this is like a confused spell lasting two to eight turns with normal saving throws. They could do this twice a day. And um, that's one unique thing about these desert orcs. They can create these dust, dust storms around them. And other weapons, they can have generally like scimitars, heavy crossbows, uh, spears, clubs, and daggers. But I just thought this was a cool variant that, you know, they could whip up this dust storm when they... When you uh, when they feel like they need a little bit more defense, so yeah, that's the desert orc. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, it is. And that's White Dwarf issue sixty four, and there's a few other little cool little baddies in here. But I thought it was a it was a it was one of the things I think if I remember back in the day when I got this, is kind of attracted me to this issue. It was like, hey, that's a cool variant of an orc. And so, also, um, there's a whole issue in Rollades with dwarves as well. Yeah. Which a lot of people forget to look through. So you want? Oh yeah, roll aids. Yeah, dwarves and orcs. Sorry, and uh, roll aids. Mm-hmm. So we'll look at that too. Cool. Anyway, I think that wraps that. Why don't we head over to uh, our last segment, treasure chest? You have opened the treasure chest. You may choose an item. And now we are opening the treasure chest and we are going to find a scroll of a spell that I grew to love when playing the old SSI gold box games. Yeah. The scroll of hold person. All we got is a scroll? Man. Yeah. Oh, it's cheap this week, okay? Who's our DM? <laughs> yeah. Vince? No. Oh. Joe. But, oh. <gasps> dun, dun, dun. So don't the question. The DM Joe. Do not question why you have this scroll. You have it for a reason. I'm okay. Sure. Yes, because it's a glorious, glorious spell. I love it. Yeah, it is. Yes. Unless you're the spell. DM. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yes, this is basically able to hold and freeze uh, humans or humanoid creatures for five or more melee rounds. And it can do up to one to three at uh, first level, at sixth level, it holds to at uh, 
six rounds, seven rounds at third level. So basically you get a plus one to the length for each level you go up. And then depending on how many people you're targeting, you actually get – they get negative modifiers to their saving throw. Because yeah. since it normally targets three characters, if you only target two, you they get a minus one. If you're only targeting one, they get a minus two to their saving throw. So how do you think you're going to use this? I'm going to use it against the one big baddie. Yep. <laughs> it's also great for thinning out uh, like a group of guards. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I would use it, and I would just be like, okay, let's just hold person. Okay, fighter go up and coup de grom. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, but it not only affects just the humanoids, though. It also affects all brownies, dryads. Dwarves, gnolls, gnomes, goblins, half-elves, halflings, half-orts, hobgoblins, humans, kobolds, lizardmen, nixies, orcs, pixies, sprites, and troglodytes. So, yeah, it's just a great, useful spell that if you're a cleric, you should know. Mm-hmm. It, that's all there is to it. And something to take in mind uh-huh. is that when cast, the if you don't, say, kill the person you're holding, they actually remember everything that happened. They're still aware of their surroundings. They just can't move or speak. So don't use it to say, oh, cast hold person on these guards and try to sneak past them. You'll get past them, but they'll know you did it. And then yeah. on the alarm and you're unscrewed. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah, I, oh, go ahead. No, I, I can't, yeah, I, I, I had the kind of a, a variant on that, like where you would – You'd cast whole, you know, person on the guards, but then you could like, you know, tie them up and then gag them, and then just, you know, go about your business, kind of a thing. Right. Yeah. It's a great way. Yeah, to, you could do that too. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, it's great for reducing uh, resistance. And then there's actually one article by Gary in Dragon Magazine issue ninety on page sixteen. He just ran through the Fiend Folio Monster Manual 2 and spelled out all creatures that were able to be affected by this spell as well. And? So, yeah. It's, it's a long list. Isn't oh, it? yeah. It is quite the <laughs> long list. And because you. Does it affect Kenku? Kenku. Yes, it does. Okay, then. If it affects Kenku, it can pretty much affect anything. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Kenku, Githyanki, Might, Mongrelman. Um, tear. Let's see. Buka, Azir. Oh, Bukas. Bukas, yes. Dugar. I mean, it's it's just basically just fleshes out the rest of the list. This also list also applies to charm person as well. So if it's on this list, you can also use charm person. So you can start using charm person on your Nixies and your Norkers, or your Shades. Would this also, uh, like the command spell, would this also encompass that? Uh, this is for any spell that says it uh, works on humanoids. These are so all command. Yeah. These, so you, this is basically the all-encompassing list of creatures that are affected by humanoid spells. Okay, cool. So, so yeah, definitely check that out, and I'll have links to this article in the show notes. And it affects how many hit dice? Uh, it's actually three? one to three creatures. It's not hit so dice. Oh, so this, yeah, so this would be like something if you were expecting to go up against the big bad evil dude. Yeah. This might be one thing to be put in your arsenal. Right. It's a, It's much better than, say, sleep that has that hit dice limitation. If you get lucky and they failed their saving throw, it doesn't matter what level they are. Yeah, if you only affect one guy, it, they're a minus two on their save. They got to make that save each round, correct? Uh, it is actually no. It's not each round. It's once it's hit, it stays for five or more melee rounds, okay. depending on your level. So they got to make that save right, right. at the beginning. Right. Okay. It's okay. A, they have one shot. So if you're okay. feeling if you're feeling lucky, go ahead and cast it and. Maybe that seventh level big bad is now all of a sudden not all that scary. Did I cast the whole person spell on two or three? <laughs> you feeling lucky, lucky. punk? <laughs> yeah. Do you? The spell is the most powerful spell in the world. <laughs> Did I just fire off one spell or two spells? <laughs> <laughs> 
but you, this would be a great spell for thieves uh, <laughs> as well. Oh, I'm going to go rob the uh, merchant. Hold. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, or like, you know, thieves. Oh, my gosh. A, a, a multi-class like magic user thief. Yeah. Deathly would be in his spell repertoire. Well, it, it's a clerical <laughs> spell. So oh, it, it's a clerical spell. Oh, so God. that's kind of how they balance some of that. So unless you were of the uh, right uh, faith where casting spells on people and taking their stuff is appropriate. So you'd be an evil cleric? A cleric assassin. Yes. Yeah. Cleric assassin. Cleric assassin. There you go. And it is a second level spell, so it's actually not coming from your god, but basically you your faith. Yeah. <laughs> you have to have faith for that to work. Exactly. You have to have faith to be able to hold a person. <laughs> or hands. One of the two. Yeah. Uh, uh, on that note. Yes, he is. <laughs> Well, I know. I think that's going to wrap the show this week. We'll wrap it up with jazz hands. <laughs> jazz <laughs> hands. Old person with jazz hands. Okay. No. You watched the movie Bring It On or something recently? Or <laughs> no. Jazz fingers. Jazz <laughs> 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 Okay, this goofy show is coming to an end. If you have any input or would like to let us know, go to orsrgaming.org slash forums and join in on the fun and talk to everyone there and communicate with us. Even Blackstone shows up every once in a while on that forum. Nuh-uh. Oh, I see a guy named Blackstone that writes in the forums. So. Yeah, he's been showing up there once in a while. Yeah. <laughs> Matt goes in there and he likes to put his posts up as well and give his two cents. I'm always there all the time. Uh, Jason, you're there often as you can be. And, uh, we invite you to be there as much as possible again after the show. And we appreciate you taking the time to stop on the show and tell us your yeah. sense. Yeah, thanks for coming up, uh, doing the show with us. No, nah, it, was, it was my pleasure. Totally. This is this is awesome. Quickly, before we, we go, we'll just do a quick uh, one out of five uh, swords as far as the module will go. Nick, what do you think, one out of five? Um. I give a four out of five swords. Four or five? Okay, Jason, what do you think? <laughs> uh, honestly, I'll, honestly I'll, I'll, I'll be nice. I'll go with uh, three swords. <laughs> but that's not your real answer. If you want to go with one or two, go ahead. Be nice. Be true. Two, 2.5. 2.5. All right. Matt? I'm going for like a 3.5. I like the concept of being able to start zero level characters and actually have the characters uh, actions determine what class they end up. That kind of appeals to me ever since the uh, old uh, Ultima game quest of the avatar, where you actually had to basically answer a questionnaire to determine what uh, uh, class you would be allowed to play. Right. I'm going to go with the 3.5 as well. I kind of like the adventure, but I don't like the ending. That's why. I yeah. I don't like the ending either. The, I, the only reason why I give it four is I, I really like the overall concept. Yeah. And they give you some good guidelines and rules to go by. Yeah. I just thought it was a unique thing for the time. So what's it going to average out to be like a three point something? I don't know. 3.75 swords? <laughs> I think less than that, like 3.6 something. I don't mm. know. Oh, you math geeks, figure it out. I'm not a math geek. Yeah. Anyway, that's going to end the show this week. And next week we'll be back with another show. And no. <laughs> yes, we will. But I'm not- hey, we gave you a fair warning, folks. That's right. And we're not going to talk about anything about the next show. Too bad. Because uh-huh. so, we don't know. Yeah, because well, exactly. We don't know. <laughs> yeah. I have to actually sit down and figure out what the heck we're going to do. Okay. More chicken for creature feature. <laughs> <laughs> More chicken. <laughs> da, 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 da. Ah! And, uh, we need to do an April Fool's show. Like Dragon Magazine used to do an April Fool's issue. If you tell people it's an April Fool's show, it's not an April Fool's show. No, we won't tell them. We'll just record it, and they'll have to figure it out for themselves. Especially yeah. considering if we record it on April Fool's Day, it won't go out for weeks. <laughs> well, they'll have to do it real soon then. Yeah. <laughs> we should do We should record a whole entire show doing second edition. <laughs> <laughs> just give all the wrong information because we have no clue about second edition. Or a whole different game system. Do it like for, I don't know, Call of Cthulhu. 
Oh, what's a, what's a D20 Radio is on Order 66 on their first year. They did an April Fool show. And their whole April Fool's, they started a couple weeks early, like, oh, they got this letter saying some bad news and it's going to affect the podcast. And then they finally led up to, you know, they, they started saying in podcasts, we can't talk about this, we can't talk about that. Then finally they said they had a brief announcement saying the podcast was over, that Lucas Arts had written them and said, cease and desist their podcast, and they were going off the air. And that was their final broadcast, one minute. They weren't allowed to talk about anything to do with Star Wars whatsoever because they were violating <laughs> And they left that message up, and then, like, you know, people were writing in and pouring, and then they're like, hey, bro, bro. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, so they had everybody all in an uproar, like, defending them and writing in, and you're like, oh, April Fools, we were just kidding. There was no letter. They don't care that we're doing a podcast <laughs> on the role-playing game. Uh, if only this was 1995, we probably would get a letter from TSR. Mm. Yeah, T, uh, dollar sign <laughs> R. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Remember those days? Oh my gosh! Yep. Yes, I put up a, a blog entry about look a look back at the TSR old website, and uh, it's funny they actually have a post in the in the FAQ section that says why TSR does not like T dollar sign R because <laughs> they find because it makes them look bad. They find the term offensive. <laughs> you have to read the fact. Oh, so the Aww. website is just so bad looking compared to today's websites. Obviously, why they had limited resources, but. For a professional company website, it looked really bad. That's all I have to say. Okay. So uh, keep it original, keep it old school, and remember, you rule the books, not the other way around. Good night, everybody. Good night. Bye, everyone. Ciao. Roll for initiative.